Yeah, so I can just click that on and off to show the board to everybody. Um, okay. So while we're waiting to start for a minute or two, since unlike usual, we're going to include the audience today. Um, how have you been the last couple of weeks? Uh, good. Uh, I'm feeling that uh, without spending as much effort as before, um, the ratings have been increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a clarity in, in kind of the goal that I'm setting for myself. Like I want to um, specialize in attacking, not specialize, but I mean, like I want to improve my attacking skills um way more than the other skills before transitioning so there's mm -hmm. a clear uh, mindset there um trying to um think about pawn structures which of them uh promoting my attack uh if if possible mm -hmm. like for example um i'm these days I'm, I'm setting a goal for myself uh whenever um an iqp is possible I should consider uh, whether it's going to be supporting my attack or not. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm evaluating my game on. If uh, if I go into the IQP correctly or not, mm -hmm. and right. whether I execute it uh, uh, like the whole attack perfectly right. or not. That that's what I'm evaluating my games on. Okay. Uh, these days, yeah. Yeah. Well, perfectly would be like a very very high standard, but it's good that you've got a clarity of both what you're working on and how you're evaluating the games. It's very useful. Yeah. 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 So I'm still in the process of reviewing all the other uh, related constructions, hanging pawns, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, to rusty on that, but uh, but yeah, I think there is a series on chess.com. Structure 101. I guess that's a good start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you're continuing to read the book that led us to this. To this. Moment yeah. Here actually, I don't. I don't remember if I finished the last chapter, but either that or I'm. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, you basically the finished chapter, that book. Almost done. Yeah. The art of the attack. Okay. Cool. Chat. How are you guys doing today? Are you there? Are you ready? Because um. I'm going to, I'm, I'm deliberately trying the experiment of recording the videos for this course live in order to be able to, you know, field questions that I might otherwise not uh, cover or not properly anticipate when recording it here. Yeah. Um, yeah, with the exception of like, Eric, Eric, you're over 2000, so this course is aimed at players from like 1200 to 2000 so you can kind of keep your 2000 plus questions to yourself maybe but everybody else <laughs> go get your food then eric that's fine go get your food <laughs> um so um but so anyway uh yeah so in another minute or so, we're gonna start doing this video. And normally when I do these lessons um, with my private students, I ignore chat during the lessons. Today, it's the opposite. I'm encouraging any questions that you have and um, I will try to, I mean, I'm not gonna answer every question. That would become a terrible course. <laughs> but, but now and then, one of your questions will improve the course, right? So. I won't get to every question, but like one or two questions here and there can be just what we need to maybe improve the whole thing. Um, nice, Francesco. Um, my tips. Well, I've done a whole I've done a whole session on this previously, but my tips include having goals when you go to it, and also having fun, and also that any preparation you do should mimic the tournament situation as much as possible so like you know if you can mimic the time control or if you can mimic like mimic like how many hours a day it might be so you get a sense of the fatigue right like if you've got a choice between doing one hour of study for 10 days or doing 10 hours of study on one day try doing 10 hours of study on one day if that's like if that's how long you're going to be playing in your tournament right do that once to see what that sort of level of fatigue is going to be like for you or you know, practice writing down your moves on a on a score sheet if you're playing games online or, 
practice wearing a mask if your tournament's going to have a mask mandate so you can see what it's like to have a mask on for whatever four hours or five hours that you play a game anything you can do that like closely mimics it will be good but yes, you are broadly free to ask questions and I'll decide which ones to answer festivity exactly. Uh, questions about the course, right? So once I start this lesson, uh, I don't want like a question about like, you know, what book should I read tomorrow? And like, you know, what videos should my niece watch and stuff like that, right? It has to be about the material I'll be talking about. So I'll be talking about how to become a good attacker. Uh, this is gonna be the intro video today so anything i bring up you can ask for like clarifications or extensions or etc or you can say i think i understand what you're saying is this am i right or wrong that sort of thing so all right let's do it maestro let's do it um this video series is inspired by maestro and he is going to be my my live audio uh, student in this course, um, and uh, yeah, so he's going to be here with me, uh, Maestro. You can poke in at any point with any questions or thoughts or clarifications and all that. Um, and uh, okay, Whew. let's see. Oh, let me see like the timestamp so I know where to cut it when I make when I try to make it a video later. All right, cool. All right, so welcome everybody to the first video in my new course on how to become a better attacker. Um, the purpose of this course and what I intend to do with it is to give you an understanding of attacks, the exercises, training techniques, and the resources that you need to become a great slayer of kings. And when we're talking about how to become a better attacker here, I didn't want to make the title any longer than it already is, but we're talking about attacking that king. We're not going after a doubled isolated pawn on the queen side and trying to like lay siege to it and win one pawn after 15 moves. No, we are trying to go into the enemy king's abode and slay that king where it stands. So that's the goal. That's what we're trying to get better at here. This is something that uh, Maestro wants to get better at. It is his current focus. Uh, it is an excellent focus. It's not the only way to win chess games, but it's a cool way to do it. So <laughs> that's what we're gonna work on here. Um, and the inspiration for this series of videos, I want to quickly say, comes from an excellent question that the maestro posed to me a couple weeks back. And essentially he said, I'm reading The Art of Attack. I'm you know, studying and trying to learn and understand uh, attacks from this book, but I feel like I'm never practicing attacks. Am I really going to learn it if I'm never actually like attacking and checkmating somebody's king? And also these situations never seem to come up in my own games. Like what's missing? Why am I not checkmating any Kings? What do I do? Do I need that practice? And how do I get that practice? I think that was a fantastic question. I felt very inspired. And so here it is Maestro, here it is. My approach, uh, and a lot of this is new stuff that I came up with for you now. I hadn't thought through all of this before, all these exercises, but some of it comes from you, and some of it is stuff that I already worked on with Affinity uh, and Baron. So I'll just throw their names out there too. We've been working, we've been working previously with them on some attacking uh, aspects. Uh, so I'll be able to port over a few things that I've done with them before and make it more systematic and clear for everybody. Perfect. All right, so like most any skill, okay, um, attacking the king is something that you can practice and you can also break it down into smaller pieces. It sounds like attacking the king is like one subject and you can just practice it. But almost any skill that you can work on, you can also break it down into smaller pieces of that skill and then practice those. Like imagine if you were like, I'm gonna practice my backhand. That might sound like just one thing to practice, but you could probably practice just holding the racket, right? With no motion, no anything, not even being on a court. You could probably practice how to hold the racket. You could probably practice how to stand and what stance to use, right? You could probably practice running around on the court without hitting the ball and just 
Like someone could be hitting balls onto your side of the court and all you're doing is just running and getting to the right spot and standing and stuff. Like, I, and I'm not a tennis coach, so I got no idea. But I would assume that you could break it down into probably like eight or 10 different small elements you could be practicing that would go into like becoming good at hitting a backhand. Um, so this attacking the king idea, I've broken it down into some smaller pieces. And I think with most skills, you can both practice them and practice the pieces. Now also, some elements of a skill are gonna be knowledge-based. Like there's gonna be stuff you have to know and other things are going to be more like how you use something or how you do something, right? So you need a mix of knowledge and ability for most things. And uh, yeah, I'm planning to give you some of both here as needed. Um, this course is also gonna include like a lot of resources. So it's gonna be focused on giving you the direction for how to work on your attacking abilities and skills. It's not gonna go over every single um, attacking idea there is. I'm not gonna comprehensively show you every single sacrifice on H6 and then every single sacrifice on G6 and every single sacrifice on F6 and then around on the seventh rank, right? But I'm gonna point you towards uh, resources and this uh, course includes not just these videos, but a lot of like handouts, basically. Um, exercise sheets or descriptions of exercises to do and so forth. So let's bring in the very first thing. What the first thing that you need to know in order to attack is you need a basic understanding of the fact that an attack is made up of multiple stages. And I can only talk about how to practice and get better at these things once you know what all these stages are. So that's the topic of our intro video today. So the stages of attack, um, there are something called preconditions for an attack. So these will occur when many players have no idea that like an attack might appear yet. So there's preconditions, things that make it possible or plausible or a good idea to attack. These things can appear on their own or you can create them deliberately, but we'll go through each of these elements uh, one at a time uh, with examples in a moment. Um, then there's trading pawns to open the game. So pawn trades open the game, yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> there's focusing on a square. There's the destruction of the defenses. There's bringing reserves. And then finally there's checkmate combinations. Now, the order of these six things is not always in the same order, although preconditions are always first and checkmate is always last. <laughs> But the ones in between there, um, my second, third, fourth, and fifth stages of an attack, they could happen in different orders. And sometimes you go through one and come back to another and, and, and then do it again. Sometimes there's many like waves. So even though I've got six kinds of stages, an attack could have eight stages to it because you might first focus on a square, then remove the defense, but then they bring in more defenders and then you bring in more reserves and then you focus on a new square and then et cetera. You know, so there could be several stages. Um, even though I've, I've got six types. I will also say that not every attack needs to go through every single one of these stages. It's possible to just walk up to the opponent's king with two pieces without too much preparation or too much reason for it, and they just let you checkmate them. Like, they just allow the first checkmate and one you threaten, and <laughs> that's it, you know, two stages or whatever, right? Um, and that would be the end of that but most attacks, I would say, go through at least four of these six types of stages. So it's, it's fairly rare already at your level, Maestro. Um, it's fairly rare that you just walk up to somebody and checkmate them without going through like a, a fairly complicated process. And uh, I forgot to say in my very first intro that this course is intended for players from about 1,200 to 2,000, but it'll be labeled as such, so it should be clear. But, um, you know, at like a 1200 level, they may have more games where someone just sort of allows like an easy version of an attack, right? And at the 2000 level, you'll be more likely to need to set up the preconditions carefully and to have more and more stages because the resistance is going to be stronger, right? The more defense you encounter, the more of these things you're going to have to do as the attacker to break down that defense 
And honestly, if you were talking at the super GM stage, you'd have a final step here, which would be called winning the end game because you're never going to checkmate Magnus Carlsen. You can do every single one of these things correctly. And at the end, he'll find a way to sack one pawn and walk away with his king or trade off your attacking pieces, right? You're never actually going to check. I mean, has he been checkmated on the board? Like, I don't know, you know, not this decade, right? So, so depending on the level of defense, you know, ultimately you, you rarely checkmate Kings and you have to win the game with the material you've, you've won through your attack. But we're going to say at the 1200 to 2000 level, it's still possible to checkmate people like in the good old days. So, so that's where we're going to end this course is uh, when you've checkmated somebody that's good enough for us today. All right. So let's, uh, you have any question before I no, get into the first no. stage? Perfect. All right. Here's the first stage of an attack. The preconditions for an attack appear. And here are four different things. And luckily, it's not too many. It's not like a list of 50 things to keep track of, right? There's so many positional elements in chess. This one's a little bit more straightforward. There's four things that would be the preconditions for attacking a king. Um, one is you've got pieces near their king. Um, the second would be that you have a space advantage near their king. Space advantage would basically allow you to then bring pieces near their king, right? Another would be the king is exposed. It has no pawn cover. Even if you don't have pieces near their king, if their king has no pawn cover, that could be something that encourages you to bring your pieces near their king, right? Or, or one of the other things, right? And finally, kings in different areas of the board. That on its own is a precondition or a possible justification for looking for an attack. So um, I'm going to create a new board here real quick. And just add a couple of these examples. So Maestro, I will add you to this board. One more board. Um, so I'm just going to start with, you know, like a very simple Rui Lopez. But now I'm playing very weird moves on purpose, right? Okay. So now already, if you look at this position, you could say that you've got a possible justification for attack in the kings being on different sides of the board. That on its own could be enough. Yeah. Right? And that's opposite side castling, and it's something you know, if we want to get way ahead of ourselves for a second, but I know, you know, we don't always think in order. You're like a flesh and blood person who wants to checkmate people. You're sitting here listening to this lesson. You're like, ooh, I can already see that this would be one way for me to get a lot of attacks in my games. You can deliberately castle on the opposite side of where your opponent castled. Even if it like doesn't make sense or it's not the move you would normally make, you can go out of your way to do that every game and you will basically get a checkmating attack in almost every game, although often it'll be against you, right? So like often the reason that somebody doesn't castle in a certain area will be that that area is just inherently weak, you know? So like with this example with black castling queenside, you know, if white goes, whoops, if white goes D4 and D5, or let's say at the start of the game that white just traded these pawns, right? and then played like d4 and black did something like this, you know, well, you're never going to see somebody castle queenside with that isolated a pawn, like straight out of the opening, right? But if you went into your games and you said, hey, we're going to get checkmating attacks every game, you can almost ensure that, nearly ensure that. You could get like a 90% incidence of checkmating attacks if you castle to an opposite side as your opponent, it's just very often it'll be your king that gets attacked, right? So like here, I can make this like super silly on purpose. We can castle queen side for black. White plays queen a7, threatening queen a8 mate. And we see that black has successfully created a mating attack in this game. It's just that, you know, it's against them. Detail. 
But that on its own is a justification. Um, and we see in these random positions I just showed another justification for uh, king side attack. Um, in this case here, the black king is lacking pawn cover, right? With the B pawn having traded and then we sack the A pawn. White only has one piece there, but white would be encouraged to, you know, try to checkmate the black king anyway. Or in the other variation I showed you with white playing g4, bishop g6, c3. Here castling queenside might not be as bad for black because white has messed with the pawn cover on their own king, which was number three on my list, the exposed king. So white's already exposed their own king somewhat, and that gives black extra reason to be like, hey, let's create a king attacking kind of position. Black could also just leave the king in the center. That would count as being in a different region than white's king and would again allow black to play a move like h5 right away without castling queenside. Okay, um, let me try and show you one of the other examples. I'll just play the French defense. The French defense is going to come up a lot because it's one of the easiest ways to just get a space advantage <laughs> on the king side for one player. So we'll play like f4. I'll have black play normal moves and sort of like fight back a little bit. Um, okay, so here white has a space advantage on the king side because of the e5 pawn. And that e5 pawn on its own, it won't justify any attack, but on its own it is a precondition for an attack. So in the French defense, in the advanced Caro and other openings that get this e5 pawn, right, you will see more kingside attacks in those positions because you've got a precondition for the attack there. Do you have any questions about uh, any of these four preconditions for an attack? Clear so far. Clear so far. All right, let's bring our slide back up. And I will repeat my comment here from the points. You need at least one of these preconditions for an attack. Like if you've got none of these things, you can't attack. You can't just be like, I want to checkmate them. So like, you know, you just send one of your pieces near their king to die by itself, right? You can't just checkmate by force of will. I think you've already discovered that recently, which is part of <laughs> where this course <laughs> comes from. So you need at least one of these uh, preconditions, but furthermore, in the course of the attack, you'll usually need to have at least one and three. Your piece is near their king. Like, how are you ultimately going to checkmate them from a distance? Like, there's some versions where, like, all the files are open and your rooks have, like, a nice checking distance and you've got, like, a rook roller checkmate. In most attacks, your pieces, some of them will have to come near the opponent's king, right? So you'll need pieces near their king and you'll need their king to be exposed. I guess a smothered mate is like an exception to that, right? Where they're completely surrounded by their own guys, they should be safe. So there's some little exceptions, but generally speaking, you'll need pieces near them and for them to be exposed. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah. I'll keep going then. All right. What is opening lines? Well, opening lines is trading pawns. Trading pawns is opening lines. Every time you trade pawns, you open at least a file and often like some diagonal, depending on whether or not there are, there are bishops. But anyway, opening lines could be files or diagonals. Uh, open lines are critical because, you know, the majority of your pieces move on either files or diagonals, and that's the firepower you need to checkmate their king. So if all those lines are blocked, by definition, you're not even checking the opponent, much less checkmating them. So you have to open lines. That much makes sense. And... Uh, I want to mention that this one can come before or after the uh, focusing on a square. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna have a problem here in a second. But anyway, let me just show you an example here. So we'll take off the slide and we'll go to example two. Okay. In example two, uh, white could play the move g4, g5 to trade their g pawn for black's h6 pawn. Does that make sense? g4, g5 to trade black's h6 pawn. And what is that going to open, Maestro? So 
that's gonna open my G file or, or the line for my rook to go to the G file. It's also gonna open up. Uh, Well, yeah. that's it. Uh, yeah. That's it. Okay. So it's going to open up the file. And, uh, yeah. Fixing something that was wrong here. All right. So that's going to open a file for the rook. And then, you know, that can be part of your attack. Um, let's go back to our slide. Um, now this can happen before or after focusing on a square. So we're going to see focusing on a square next. Okay. Sometimes you'll, sometimes this will be the next thing you do after preconditions is you'll just go and open the file with this G pawn, right? Mm -hmm. But here's our next option. Focusing on a square. Um, so this is a trickier one that, um, this is something that, you know, I've had very, very strong students. Uh, struggle with like it was basically like it'd be like a missing element that they don't realize this is part of what you need to do focusing on a square is to pick one or more squares near the king to then aim multiple pieces at this is based on the idea that if you attack on um, i mean you can look back at that same position before i played g4 g5 if you want right if you attack h6 with one piece g7 with one piece h7 with one piece and f7 with one piece that basically never produces an attack. Okay? Like, you won't actually create a threat on any of those squares. Your pieces essentially will not be coordinated, someone would say. It's true that ultimately to checkmate a king, you have to attack all the squares around him. But to break through to him, there needs to be focus. That's just absolutely mm -hmm. required. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um... So, you know, you could have five attacking pieces and one defender, right? But if you attack each square once, you don't actually take advantage of having five pieces versus one. Mm -hmm. um, now, another thing to say about focusing on a square is usually focusing on a square is not going to be decisive, right? Unless somebody lets you just threaten queen h7 checkmate and they don't defend it, you know, you focus on h7 with two pieces and you checkmate in one move, great. But generally speaking, what focusing on a square is, is going to do is it's just going to force a weakness from your opponent. Like they'll have to respond to the fact that you're threatening g7 with three pieces and they'll have to, you know, play g7 to g6 and make a new weakness or they'll have to like retreat their pieces or start running away with their king into the open or something, you know. This is usually going to force something but not just like win the game. And it's very likely that you may need to refocus on a new square one or more times as your opponent adjusts and allocates resources to defending g7, then maybe you can get to h7 or something like that, right? So mm -hmm. if, I if I ask you in a certain position, and you can switch to example one if you like. If I ask you in a certain position what square you should focus on, that means for the next stage of the attack, not for the whole attack, right? Mm -hmm. So if I give you this position, do you have any sense of what the first square might be that white would focus on? H7. H7, right? Now, that doesn't guarantee that you're eventually going to win this game on H7. It mm -hmm. just says right now that's the most logical place to coordinate against. By the way, you're right about H7, mm -hmm. right? So that's the most logical place to focus on at the moment, but that may cause a weakness which leads to another phase in the attack, right? Mm -hmm. And um, now let me use this example to show you how focusing on a square or opening lines can happen in either direction, right? So from this example that you have here, most attackers would start with knight to g5, if it lets me let go of this pawn. Okay, right? Normally they would start with knight to g5. Um, let me turn this on. Okay, normally they would start with knight g5, threatening queen h7 checkmate. And typically black would play the move g6 to prevent it right? Now that there's a pawn on g6, white might switch from focusing on a square to opening a line, mm -hmm. right? And here, what would be opening a line? Uh, maybe h4, h5? h4, h5, right? And then you'll trade on g6. 
Now, if you're successful with that next like two-step plan, once you've done that, you will now pick a new square to focus on. Hey, maybe it'll be H7 and H8 again if the H file opens up for your rook on H1, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. Now, you've got another option here. You could you could still focus on H7 and try and create more weakness with queen H3. Maybe they play H5. And then again, you're going to switch to opening lines with G4. Mm -hmm. And, you know, attacking is going to get tricky. These are very basic examples, but you can already see that we've got a choice between trying to open the H file or the G file. Like queen H3 made more weaknesses, which is good, but now with G4, we're opening a file that doesn't look as good. For one thing, our rook's not on it, and the G6 pawn is still defended, right? So if you compare that with my first option of going H4, H5, the opponent doesn't yet have as many weaknesses, but you're opening the rook on H1, so that might even be better, right? So th there are hard decisions that are going to come up soon, but you can already see the mechanism, right? You focus on something, maybe you make a weakness, then you open a file, right? If you go back to example two, we can do the opposite thing. In example two, we can go, you know, like G4. Wait, it didn't let me, sorry. G4, there we go. Bishop d7, g5. Pawn takes, bishop takes, let's say. And rook c8. Well, now we're picking a new square to focus on, right? And now that's going to be g7, right? It's because we've got that file. So we play rook g1, we focus on g7. So this one, we went from opening a file to then focusing on a square. Last one, we went from focusing on a square to then having the means to open a file. And that can switch again and again. Here you might attack g7 until you force your opponent to play g6. Then you might focus on g6 instead of g7. You might play h4, h5. You might play bishop d3 takes on g6. You have different kinds of options. But you can see how as you start to get the idea of how these things play together, it starts to become logical to pick up what your next options are even if it's still going to be tricky to pick them and calculate them later, right? But that's why I said the order of these stages is not set in stone, right? You can just as easily focus on a square and then open a line or open a line and then focus on a square. It can go either way quite easily. Mm. Okay, now we'll get to the next phase, unless you've got any questions here. Uh, actually, I just wanted to to um, comment on this point because mm -hmm. focusing on a square was really the toughest point that I've come across in the Art of Attack book. Mm -hmm. And usually I'm just like consistently wrong about finding these uh, squares. Like, uh, which, because which some of the, like, yeah, exactly. Some of the positions are really complex and uh, I don't sense and kind of a clear uh, plan for an attack. And then mm -hmm. the author just points out, um, uh, a weak square or something right and i'm like i'm consistent about that point like i'm always failing it so so it's a tough one and um i'm still not getting a sense on how to be i guess i guess it comes with practice i don't know but maybe, I, yeah. you'll see a few videos from now um i'll go in depth on that in a video just on that uh how to get better mm -hmm. at it so far the examples i've given you it's yeah very obvious which square you would you would go for these are not at yeah. that complexity level yeah when we get to that part i'll show you some examples and i'll show you like an exercise for practicing it and if you feel the examples i give you then are not complicated enough for you to be able to start feeling like you could get that right in the examples in the art of attack book then you can tell me so and 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 we'll look at some harder examples together sure okay so we'll turn our slides back on, and from focusing on a square, we will advance to destruction of the defenses. And destruction of the defenses is removing and trading off defenders, and very often it's getting rid of their pawn cover, sometimes by sacking a piece for like two or three pawns in front of the king. Um, the reason that it's often removing the pawn cover is like in general people put their king behind pawn cover so they have it. In general, if you're attacking the king, it's often because they don't have that many defenders there. So often destruction of the defenses means tearing through that pawn cover, right? Like either because your opponent was careless, they left the king without enough defenders, 
or because you engineered a space advantage and played logically towards the attack and there just isn't room for that many defenders. Um, you know, for whatever reason, like they're typically only going to have one or two defensive pieces when you're trying to checkmate their king, but they're typically going to have a pawn cover. So it could be like trading off, you know, if we go back to the position in front of us, it could be trading off the knight on f6. You could say, hey, that's the only good defender of the black king. I'll trade it off, right? That could be it. So it could be just saying like, you know, I want to trade this knight, right? Or, you know, let's say your opponent goes like knight h7, you go bishop here and they go g6, right? Or more commonly, it's going to be demolishing the pawn structure, right? With something like knight h4 takes g6 or bishop d3 takes g6. Rook here works as well. Rook takes. Very good. Aha. <laughs> You're paying attention. <laughs> Why wait and bring in a knight or bishop if we're going to sacrifice and checkmate? Let's mm -hmm. just throw the rook at them. Absolutely right. So that is a very, very classic example of what destruction of the defenses could look like, right? Uh, you've got a little bit of everything already in this example, although it's like kind of like a dumbed down example where I've played for black, like just sort of like a, you know, practice dummy to just beat on. But, um, but you've also calculated successfully a short checkmating combination here as well, right? In this, in this phase at the end here. So on um, occasionally you can win a game without destroying the defenses. Like your opponent will have a square so weak on like G7 or H7 that you can sort of move around their pieces and just go checkmate them. Um, and if you've seen like color complex weaknesses would sometimes be an example of that. You know, sometimes you could do something like, you know, knight here, here. These moves are absolutely silly, but I just <laughs> trying to quickly set it up. Sometimes your opponent's just like so weak on a square, like all their pawns are on light squares and you just sort of like waltz through like on the dark squares. So it is possible to checkmate a king without destruction of defenses, but it's rare. The most common examples I can think of where it happens is if one person is really weak on dark squares and strong on light squares and then vice versa, and you can sort of maneuver through just their weak squares. Mm -hmm. Okay, but typically almost every attack is going to have destruction of the defenses. Now, this example here is a little bit on the simple side, so rook takes g6 is both the destruction of the defenses and the final calculation of the game, right? Um, so, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of conflated, right? And somebody could say destruction of defenses, it's just a checkmate combination. And someone else could say, you know, um, where's the checkmating combination? All I did was destroy the defenses and then I didn't have to calculate anything, right? I... I traded off the pawn cover and like, you're not going to call queen g7 a checkmating combination. I mean, that's just, it's just a move. I didn't have to calculate. So since they kind of come together, you could, in some cases, you know, you could say like, oh, is it this or is that? I would say it's both at once in this case. Um, any questions about destruction of the defenses, sort of like what it is, as with all of them, we'll get into it more in depth. It's clear. Clear. Okay. Well then, next up after destruction of the defenses, there's the idea of bringing in reserves. Um, so let's go to example one instead of example two for this. <laughs> and example one, you could say that you started an attack with your knight and queen on h7 and that they successfully produced a weakness against the king who white has a space advantage on the king side and black has a lack of defenders, right? So there's the preconditions. Now white makes a checkmating threat and successfully makes a weakness, but you weren't really going to checkmate with two pieces. So now we get into the, this idea of like destruction to defenses with h4, h5, trying to trade off g6 and stuff. But again, this is two things at once. Now we're bringing in reserves. The rook on h1 is a reserve in this attack, right? Um, if... If your opponent like challenged the knight on g5 with like bishop e7 somehow from somewhere, right? Uh, then you could play knight d2 to f3. That would again be bringing reserves. So let's say your opponent cheats and brings reserves from off the board. Oh, what a move. Um, you don't blink. You just move the knight from d2 to f3. You bring in your own reserves legally. And, you know, you still have, have a good attack here. Mm -hmm. um 
So yeah, bringing in reserves, I mean, it's kind of simple. It is what it says it is. It's bringing new pieces. Um, sometimes you, you use a reserve by like using the square that another piece was on. So like here with the knight on f3, you could say the knight's not attacking the king, right? It needs an opportunity to, um, to attack the king, right? And so sometimes the way you would bring in the reserve is you would trade the piece on g5, right? And then bring the next knight to g5. So often that's how you bring a reserve is like you don't have you don't usually have control of every single square in front of their king. <laughs> Otherwise, it's already kind of over, right? So you may only have two or three squares that you sort of own to work with your outpost squares, your squares that are available to you. So you may often vacate a square with a trade and then bring in the reserve that way. Um, also, in general, this can often be similar to like opening a line for a rook or a bishop could be a way of introducing your rook or your bishop as a reserve. The queen and knight, which are more maneuverable in closed positions, can often start an attack, and then the bishops and rooks might need trades to get in there, right? Um, finally, um, let me introduce the concept that a pawn can become an attacker in a position like this. I'm going to try and bring some things back. Uh, I'm going to use an example that uh, many people may be familiar with, which is the bishop takes h7 sack. Okay, so I've got white down like, well, two light squared bishops is helping. <laughs> Let's see, we got to get rid of one of these. All right, there we go. Um, so now white's down two pieces. That's kind of a lot. We'll put this one on. And okay, here we go. So now bishop h7 check, king h7. Whoops. Bishop h7, king h7, knight g5, check. Bishop takes, pawn takes. Here's a reserve on h1 as well as an open line. King here, queen h5, threatening checkmate. So we've got focus now, right? Focus on h8. We're also starting to calculate some short checkmating ideas, right? Like, oh, queen h7 would be mate, you know? If the rook moves, how are we going to give checkmate? So f5, clearing an escape square for the king, right? And this pawn on h4 is replacing an attacking knight on g5 that was covering f7 and h7, right? And now this pawn goes up to g6. And once a pawn is in good enough position near the king, the pawn's like an extra attacker. If a pawn is covering two squares near the enemy king, like, that's good. So a pawn on f6, g6, g5, f7, h6 can often be an extra attacker, right? Uh, like here. So this is an example of, of a pawn can become an extra attacker if it gets into a good enough position. So Did you mention e5 in that list? No. E5, mm -hmm. no. If you're putting like a piece on, on d6 or f6 where you could like recapture, then yes. Um, if their king had fled into the center and were on e5 and was short of... If their king were on e7 and was short of squares partly because of the pawn, then yeah, they would have been herded to an area where the pawn kind of helps as an attacker. But uh, at this stage, no. The pawn is great. It's the precondition for your attack, as you may remember. It's that space advantage from the pawn on e5. It's the reason there's no knight on f6, right? So you've removed a defender very, very early in the opening phase when you played e5 and they moved the knight away from f6, probably even before they castled. You removed the defender in case they castled kingside, and then they castled kingside. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the pawn on e5 would not be an attacker at this point. If you're trying to account attackers and defenders, for example, to see how likely you were to succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Shall we go to the last step? Yeah. All right. Calculating combinations. This slide is going to be pretty simple. All right. Here's what it says. No matter how good the position you create for yourself is at some point, no matter how exposed their king is or how many pieces you have near their king, at some point you need to calculate forcing variations accurately. Right? It's true that people who can't calculate well do occasionally win chess games, but very rarely by checkmate, right? I mean, they usually have to use other methods of winning their games, right? Like material accrual or some like positional 
approach where you know you gradually squeeze your opponent down but it's hard to be like a checkmater of kings if you can't calculate some variations at the end so there it is that's the final stage of an attack and the final like necessary qualification for a would-be checkmater is to be able to deliver a checkmate um Perfect. You know, and it's something like when you play bishop takes h7 in a position like this, seeing the move g6 already coming. That's not like an easy calculation for a player at like a 1500 to 1600 level. The only reason that a 1500 or 1600 might see that move coming in advance is because they're familiar with some of the themes around bishop h7. If they have a familiarity with a certain set of attacking ideas, then they can see it coming three or four moves ahead. Otherwise, that's like a pretty long calculation, four moves ahead to see that that g-pawn coming to g6 takes away that escape square mm -hmm. um but that's an example of that and um now i'm going to play through a full game for you so you can see all the phases nice. of an attack so you're going to turn to the analysis board called game mm -hmm. and we're done with slides for today so uh, this is game, and I'll provide one little note about this game here. I believe this game was played a week after I had beaten this opponent with the King's Gambit, and it's the one and only time I can think of someone being afraid of the King's Gambit and switching openings away from the King's Gambit <laughs> as black. <laughs> so they didn't play e5 because of the King's Gambit. So anyway, we get a Peart's defense with an Austrian attack. All right. And at this point, the first precondition for an attack has already appeared. Mm -hmm. And e5 what is that? E5 pawn. E5 pawn. You're ready to teach this course for me. Perfect. <laughs> so the E5 pawn. Are the kings in different areas? Well, white could leave the king in the center, castle queen side. Mm -hmm. So that's possible. Is the black king exposed? No. Not yet. No. Does white have a preponderance of pieces near the black king? No. Mm, not yet. So we're very, very far away from like dreaming of checkmate from a certain perspective, right? Mm -hmm. But the pawn on e5 is already one of those preconditions, which means if you want to, you can already start thinking about it. Yeah. And you may know this just from knowing me or from the context of this course. But I, at this stage, already anticipate the possibility of a kingside attack. The moment mm -hmm. I'm playing e5, it's deliberately to create one of the preconditions because I would like to checkmate, please, and thank you. Mm -hmm. So knight to d5 is played, right? The black knight. One defender has been removed, but black's got plenty. But look at this. White slips past that knight and heads towards the king side, rather than trading the knight that's now central. I mean, it's on a fine square on d5, but white's saying, okay, maybe maybe I'll go accumulate pieces on the king side, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, knight c6, challenging d4. This telegraphs, though, that black's going to play f6. Normally, you would try and undermine white's structure with the c5 move. So if black blocks their own c-pawn with knight c6, it's not because they're really pressuring d4, it's because they're getting ready to fight for e5. We overprotect d4 anyway, even though we see f6 coming. And now bishop c4. And it turns out black doesn't want to open the queen attacking the knight on d5. So they move the king off that diagonal. Mm -hmm. And now white castles. What? <laughs> That's not a precondition for attack. Well, no, but... You know, the center was going to get opened faster than the king side, so the center was not a good place for the king. Again, as I said, you could get an attack here. You could ensure that the game is decided by checkmating attacks if you leave your king in the center as white. You can ensure that. That's enough. You know, if you leave your king on e1, then your opponent's got reason to trade on e5. And if their king's here, you could play h4 right now. Mm -hmm. Right? Try and bring the rook. Try and open lines. Try and trade off some of their pawn cover. Oh, yeah, you'll get a checkmating attack here. It's just mm -hmm. that I judged that when black takes on e5 and the d and f files are both already open and we haven't yet played h5, I just judged there was a very good chance that black's attack would come first. 
Mm -hmm. However, it's clearly a mess. You could outplay somebody. Who knows who's going to get checkmated first here, right? Yeah. What we do know is from a perspective of understanding the preconditions for an attack, the preconditions are there. This game is going to have an attack. Two, in fact, at the same time. So that's an option. But white castles. Now black calculated some variations that show that trading on e5 doesn't work, even now. So they changed their mind. I'm not going to give you long variations because we're just trying to talk about what the stages of the attack are, right? So black plays f5, which could give black some space on the king side, right? As they gain space, they could neutralize white space advantage. Here comes a piece towards the king side, right? Black plays h6. Now, preconditions for attack. We've got the space advantage on e5. We don't have a preponderance of pieces near the enemy king, but we already have a decent degree of access, right? The bishop's on an open diagonal there. This bishop's there. This knight's definitely in the king's face. This one's a reserve. The rook's got a semi-open file, so it could at least lift. And, of course, the queen has avenues as well, right? We've got another precondition which has appeared, which is the black king's pawn cover. He still has all the pawns, but when you've advanced them all, I would consider that a compromised pawn cover. So we can already say that white's got all the preconditions for an attack. Some of them white only has half, but like you've got the preconditions for attack are all poking up here, okay? Now, I didn't pick a game that's played perfectly. There's mistakes in this game, and you know, I have a video already where I've analyzed this game. My goal is just to show it to you to, to illustrate the phases. So what white does here is they play queen e1, bringing another piece to attack the king, right? What square does white have in mind to focus on? Because white already has an idea of focus. White's already decided the preconditions are there. We're bringing pieces there. We're going for an attack. The attack is go. White's already decided that. By the time white decides that, they already have an idea of where to focus. I would say h7. h7? h7's mm -hmm. hard to get to at the moment. Oh, you're thinking, you're assuming black's going to take the knight, the next knight's going to come, and then white will have an avenue to h7. Yeah. Okay. If we were going to go after h7, we'd have to know that we can force black to take the knight, not just that black can take the knight. Mm -hmm. So white's first focus square is h6. The yeah. threat is to go queen h4, then move the knight and play bishop takes h6. That's white's chosen focus point with queen e1. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if black takes the knight, as we said... The focus square can change quickly. And it's not like white didn't anticipate that on pawn g5, knight g5, then the focus square would become h7 exactly as you said. Mm -hmm. Right? So it can switch very quickly. But at the mo but you have to have in mind like how you're going to break through first, right? Okay. Yeah, and here sense. where white plays queen e1, there are two logical focus squares white could have chosen between. One was h6. Do you know what the other one is? I know this is a very tough thing for you, but just in case you know chat you can you can guess as well what's the alternative focus square here maybe um g6 if, if the queen goes to g3 g6 exactly right g6 is undefended it's quite near the opponent's king so as you said maestro you could go queen e1 to g3 there's also the move knight h4 here which is surprised because you want this knight to go to g5. So it's like, it's a hard move to see. But it, if your focus is g6, if for some reason you thought g6 is a square, like what do I do? Then you can come up with this move. Right? The pawn is actually basically indefensible because of queen e8, bishop d5. So anyway, so white had two squares. White went queen e1. Black takes. White brings a reserve. Right? And this, this game is analyzed in entirety in my video series on reserves, which we'll get to in a few weeks. <laughs> but you can see the first reserve come, and now we've got a change in focus to h7. And of course, the Black King's structure has been partly weakened by themselves, by their own choice. But again, as I said, the destruction of the defenses is often trading minor pieces for pawns, right? And that's already happened here. So black defends, white brings the next reserve, right? And now as far as, 
we don't have to think too much about preconditions of attack once the attack has been decided that it is happening. But you can see that white's got all the pieces there. White was right to think that they could bring more pieces there quickly. Right? And if this e5 pawn were on e3, then you wouldn't have the bishop, so you wouldn't have a threat to h6, so black would have never had to take, and you also wouldn't have ideas in this position like knight e6 check and then taking the bishop, right? So, you know, if white didn't have that pawn on e5, black would have knight f6 as well, rook f6. So we can see how this, like, is now playing a role, this precondition. But it's not an attacking piece. Okay, so queen comes in, black defends it, and, um... Here, black has successfully defended h6 and h7 for the moment. And uh, if you think your opponent's ready to lose, you can calculate knight e6, bishop e6, and then queen or bishop takes on h6. You could say, this is the final phase, right? The last stage is, is what, maestro? Checkmating uh, combinations. Checkmating combinations. So let's see if this is a checkmating combination. Check here, check here, check here hmm check here we didn't quite checkmate right it was close i mean the king only had one square a couple times so we don't have a checkmating combination yet right so in this position what does white decide to do what can you do if you don't have a checkmating combination yet you've gone through the first wave or two of your attack we had a focus square of queen h7 checkmate, but the opponent seems to be preventing it at the moment. We don't have like a like a simple calculation to end the game. Do you remember what the other stages are? What are the other things we can try and do when we're partway through an attack? Remove a defender. We could try to remove a defender. Um, open line. We could open a line or we could focus on a new square. Or we could bring reserves. Right? Those are the four intermediate phases. I'm going to flash the slideshow again for everybody watching and go back to the first one, stages of attack. So we could do trading pawns to open the game, focus on a new square, remove defenders, destruction of the defenses, or bring reserves. Right? Okay. So what white decides to do is to play g4, which falls under which category? That's the opening up lines. Opening lines. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. And uh, this also partly includes the fact that White started by calculating this variation, right, that doesn't work, and then realized that this variation involves chasing the black king across the F file, so, like, it would be nice if the F file were open. <laughs> right? Um, so... You try an idea, and then you think backwards from that idea. How can you make it better, and how can you make it work? All right, mm -hmm. so black does a trade. And then, so that's both a trade of an attacker and a defender, and that's why this game is so important to understand from a perspective of reserves. Every time there are going to be trades, you ask yourself, who's going to be able to bring in new pieces? Because now there's new squares available, right? Like... The black rook can come defend on these h7, h6 squares on the h file now, right? Um, you know. Yeah, I was wondering why the bishop didn't take on g5. But and now, since white doesn't have a knight here, white could put the queen or the bishop there, right? And I think the reason the bishop didn't come was probably the rook h8 covering mm -hmm. h6 ridiculous. and chasing white's queen back. Mm -hmm. Um. So the queen comes, and um. Yeah, now white's basically threatening to do something like check, check. You know, when the king goes to e8, you just win the pawn on g6 and then play gf5. And then mm -hmm. sort of, then the pawns become attackers, right? Because they're getting to e6 and f6 and they're taking all the squares. So black plays f4 now to try and block out white's bishop and rook. Okay. So now here's what white does. And I'm just going to ask you if you can identify which of the phases this is. White plays bishop d3. What phases would you call, would you say this is related to? Focal point. Okay, new focus point, right? We've given up on h6 and h7, right? We don't have the knight to go to h7. We don't have the bishop to go to h6, right? So we're changing focal points. 
Mm -hmm. And depending on whether or not you think this bishop is part of the attack, I think it sort of is, but you could also call it like reserves, right? If you're like switching the focus of a piece. I would say this is more in line of changing focus, right? Like the bishop was already well placed on c4. We're just changing focus. Okay. Black defends it. H4. What phase is H4? Uh, opening up lines. Opening lines. Does white, do white's moves have focus to them, would you say? Does this move connect with queen g5 and bishop d3? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. definitely white has focus this game. They're not like, oh, h6, oh, g6, like randomly. No. <laughs> They're looking at where can they actually overpower black? Where could they bring, bring more attackers than defenders? And then they pick that new focus, right? So h4 mm -hmm. comes, threatening h5. Yeah. Now, black sees as the only way to defend g6 to play knight e7. And so black plays e6 to create this defensive move. Mm -hmm. Okay. But remember, focus on one square creates a new weakness. White now switches their focus from g6 just after getting this one different move from black. White says, you know what? Yeah, I don't want to trade everything on g6 after knight e7, right? So white now simply trades everything on f4. What phase is this move here? Or phase is, because sometimes they overlap. Mm. I'm not sure exactly what why he's thinking, but uh, it's definitely uh, a lot. Uh, like, I, I, I'm thinking at some point, after all the trades, the rook on a1 is going to come into the attack so that you're absolutely that right and what phase would you call that that's the reserves that's the reserves know. right yeah. um and another thing anytime a pawn comes off the board what phase is it yeah that's opening lines opening lines so bishop f4 is a mix of opening lines and bringing reserves it also ah. suggests that white has switched which square they're aiming at a little bit yeah, probably f6 is going to They've be... spotted a new potential weakness on f6. Now, that's yeah. assuming that, you know, black's not going to be able to defend against queen h6 with anything other than trading off all white's pieces, mm -hmm. right? Which is correct. So you could say, oh, white's focusing on h6, but they've seen that if black trades, then they'll focus on, on f6, right? But they've yeah. definitely switched from g6, right? They're like, ooh, these dark squares are suddenly weak after this move here. Would this be also re removing defenders, or would we just count that as bringing reserves? Yeah, I mean, you're removing the f-pawn, and the f-pawn was being used to block out your bishop and rook, right? That was part of the opponent's pawn cover in any variation where his king runs across on the f-file as well. So yeah, this is also removing uh, the defenders. Yeah. No, I meant like because of the exchanges that are possible here. If the rook right. uh, on f8 is going to be exchanged, so that's a one yes. less defender. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the trades happen. Um, otherwise, black would have to play rook h8 to stop queen h6. Mm -hmm. Right? And then white would have gotten control of the f-file. This is another option for black, and it would have played out another way. But anyway, black goes for the trades. And now we've removed a bunch of defenders, right? Mm -hmm. We've also, you know, traded off our rook on f1. So the question is, who's going to bring... The reserves first and as we can already tell it's the rook on a1 which is going to come to f6 mm -hmm. so without calculation at a theoretical level you've already understood how this whole game is going to play out black plays queen e7 trying to harass white with queen takes h4 white plays a very very important move refocuses on g6 that was your queen's job force her back Otherwise, you're playing a move like g5 that blocks your own lines for your queen, right? Or you're retreating. Mm -hmm. So white sees a better option. Queen e4, the queen's forced back, rook f1. Uh-oh, right? Mm -hmm. Knight here, rook here. Black develops. What phase would h5 be? Opening lines. Yes, and are we opening a file or a diagonal? Uh, a diagonal. Yeah. Maybe a diagonal, right? Yeah. Like almost every trade so far was, we were sort of focused on like the rooks coming in, right? But here you can mm -hmm. see white's interested in playing queen h7 checkmate, right? So they're trying to mm -hmm. like pry that open 
And if black won't trade, then maybe white can play hg rook f7 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Bishop c6, queen f4, knight d5, queen g5. I think black like resigned around here, but I'm going to show a few more moves for you. So you can see like the final phase of the attack here. At this point, you should probably have calculated a little something for white. You know, if you like allowed the queen and rook to get attacked, unless you're really confident in like how reserves work. But who's the reserve attacker here? Uh, the pawn? The pawn has just been promoted to attacker. So almost every white piece has been traded off. But white continues to come up with reserves, right? Mm -hmm. King here. Bishop here. White's down an entire rook, but like all these pawns are becoming attackers, right? And because of the position of these pieces, white still has one of the preconditions for attack, which is more attackers near the king. But if you said just queen and bishop against queen and king, you would not expect a checkmate, and you'd be right. There would be no checkmate. But with two extra pawns, if these are if these pawns are now people, despite what Jesse says, <laughs> then white has a preponderance of attackers here right of four attackers against like one defender mm -hmm. and after something like this check here here it's basically going to be checkmate right this kind of stuff requires like a small calculation we're in the final phase here right so you saw all the phases of calculation there with one long example I'm going to bring the slide up again and just ask you again, Maestro and anybody in chat, does anybody have any questions about what the stages of attack are? Clear. Crystal clear. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody in chat suffering from any confusion? In a game, do you actively think about the stage of an attack? Great question right there. All right. I'm glad we're doing it like this. Okay, that's a great question. Is that something that it's like helpful to think about during your game? To be like, have I checked off the stages of attack? To some extent, yes. I think yes. Like, first of all, you shouldn't launch an attack if you haven't thought about whether you've got the preconditions for it, right? And then... If you try to attack without picking a focus square, well, you're not going to succeed, right? So as I said, the stages from stage two through five, trading pawns, focusing on a square, destruction defenses, and bringing reserves, they can actually go in almost any order, right? And this game you guys just saw, you saw waves of attack, right? And it's not like white brought in reserves once. <laughs> they brought in every single guy except the pawn on A2, right? So there were... but. In between, there was opening lines or focusing on a new square, destroying the defenses, then bringing in reserves again, right? So those stages don't go in order. So you don't need to think like, oh, I'm at stage three. Next, I need to do stage four, right? You don't have to say, I focused on a square, so now I have to open a line. But you do need to do almost all of these things. So when you're looking for like attacking ideas, the way you're going to come up with attacking ideas is by asking yourself questions like, what square should I focus on? Or how can I open a file for my rook or my bishop? Right? So, so you're going to have to go through the thoughts behind these stages of attack in order to attack successfully. If you forgot completely that you needed to remove your opponent's defenders of their king and went through your whole attack and you're like, I keep repositioning my pieces, but like there's always defenders in my way. And you never thought of like, trading them off or chasing them away with your pawns or something like that, like you wouldn't be successful in your attack. So in that sense, you do need to think about the stages of attack somewhat. You don't need to think about which stage you're in necessarily. You need to always be looking for any of those options. And it can be helpful to have a sense for when checkmate combinations are plausible, right? That one's time dependent. Right, So if you've got a position that's ripe for checkmate and you don't think that it's time for checkmate and you keep just opening lines or bringing reserves and you, you don't stop and calculate, you could miss your chance to do it. If you start calculating checkmate combinations too soon, and uh, I will call up my position again. Let's say we go to this position here 
and we start trying to calculate checkmating combinations for white in this position here. Well, white's attacking with queen and bishop against queen and rook, there's like a pawn that you can maybe trade. It's not yet time to checkmate, right? And if you try calculating now, there's two things that can go wrong. One, you calculate something that you think works even though it doesn't and you go for it. But more likely what happens is you waste your energy. You've got a certain amount of calculating power and you get tired as you calculate, right, Maestro? Mm -hmm. So if you spend all your effort trying to calculate checkmates now, then when the time comes later on in the game and your opponent's like, a, you know, and you're thinking like, huh, do I play queen f4, queen e3, queen, queen e1 to avoid knight d5? Like, you might not have the energy now to calculate the rook sacrifice, right? So that's the biggest way it's going to, like, hurt you to try and calculate checkmates when it's too soon. So it's helpful to have a sense of when you might plausibly be entering the final phase where it's a good idea to calculate checkmate combinations. So that is useful to have. Uh, we've got a question, how to pick the correct focus square. That's the subject of a future video. Do the stages of attack apply to closed positions? Yes, Jim Stir. Now, closed positions, you can have the preconditions for attacking. You can start attacking in, but you eventually have to open them. So you can attack in closed positions, and everything I've said applies, but you'll have a required phase that will be trading pawns to open the game, stage two, and destruction of the defenses, stage four. You'll probably have to go through quite a bit of stages two and four to checkmate an opponent in a closed position. Unless they fianchettoed, traded their g7 bishop, let you walk a pawn to f6 and a queen to h6, you know, with no other reserves and no open lines. But generally speaking, attacks build in closed positions, Similarly, but require the opening. Require the opening up. All right. So here are my concluding thoughts on these stages of attack, Maestro. You could be good at some of these phases of attack and still have basically no success as an attacker in your game. You could be great at... Um, you could know every checkmate pattern but never have like an actual attacking position. So you never checkmate anybody. You sit there like trading pawns on the queen side and in your head, <laughs> you've got 2000 diagrams of cool little checkmates, but they're not coming up, right? Or on the other hand, you could be an ace at every single other thing. You know how to like set up the preconditions well in advance. You know how to like spot like good focus squares for creating new weaknesses. You can see where you're likely to force pawn trades and where you can't force pawn trades and you know how to open up the lines. You're aware of like what your reserve potentials are versus your opponent's reserve defenders. But you can't calculate anything. You just you you don't know the basic checkmate patterns, or even if you know some of them, you can't like check one move ahead whether or not they're working in a certain position. You're like, does queen h7 checkmate work here or not? I'm not sure. You play it, and then there's a knight on f8 that takes your queen. If that's where your calculation is at, right? Knight on f8, there's no mate, that old saying, right? If your calculation is at that phase, then you will never have successful attacks either, despite being great at all the other phases, okay? So that's an important thing to realize, right? You'll, you'll have checkmates on the board and you just won't see them or play them in that final scenario, right? So ultimately, to be a great attacker, you're going to need all of these. You're going to have to have some ability at all of these things. And I intend to show you how to build that ability perfect looking forward to that all right till the next lesson everybody take care prepare yourselves there's more to come and uh, you will need to be actively engaged in this to get the most out of these videos and the course materials that are coming along with them so i know right now i'm talking at you and you're just sort of like sitting there but wake up get active Get ready because the material's coming. And if you want to, you can become a terrific king attacker. There's nothing that can prevent you except yourself. All right. So we'll cut it there for that video. Um, 
thank you everybody for participating. Um, whether I happen to notice and use your questions or not, um, there were definitely good questions and they were helpful. Um, the next video in this series is one which won't be recorded live because Maestro doesn't need it. But I intend to record video three live next Thursday at the same time with Maestro. Okay, so that's our plan for next week um, is to record video three live. And as long as this seems to work well, we'll continue recording all these videos live. They will eventually be a course which you'll be able to purchase from the Dojo shop. Um, but uh, for the moment, if uh, if you if you don't anticipate having two dollars in a couple months when when the course is complete, um, you can you can schedule eight p.m. Thursday and catch these live, and uh, then you won't have all the course materials. But at least you'll have heard what all the exercises are, and most of them you can figure out on your own. So, yeah. That's that's the plan with this. Um, and now, uh, Maestro, is there anything you need to talk with me about other than attacking? Other than attacking, no. Uh, but I was gonna ask uh, if you could uh, let me know what to do uh, before next session, like if if I need to practice mating attacks or uh, sorry, mating combinations or anything to do before next session you know there's nothing from this that you need to practice yet i think yeah. it was all crystal clear and all the exercises are like phase specific right there's nothing like to work on from yeah. the intro so mm -hmm. um you can just try and play a couple of serious games if you get the chance right and that's mm -hmm. and that's enough and i know you're already starting to try and attack and i'll give you advice on how to practice that better when we get to it but for now you can just you know, do it on your own, however, however you think of, um, and yeah, I mean, I know you started a new job, so, you know, if you've got time to play some games and energy to play some games, I think that'd be the best use of time for now. Awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Cool. You're welcome. <laughs> See you next time. And now let's bring in Baron and Finity. Hello. Hey. Just changing my setup briefly here. How are you two doing? Good. Pretty good. Sorry about the massive delay today. That's all right. I got a chance to get some more work done. All right. I've changed my setup and the course information and everything should be fine here. Um, okay. So, um, so Baron, uh, you said that you, uh, put some games up. Um, yep. so, uh, let me see if I can grab those, but I've also prepared something I want to do with you. So it's fine that you said it's only a couple games because I'll probably try and go through them quickly. <laughs> Well, they're more or less pretty short games, too. All right. Um, hang on. I just have to find library. It's still so, sort of a new um, thing for me. Why is it not showing? 
Did I get logged out while teaching my lesson? It's weird. I was using uh, chess.com pretty actively there. Uh, <laughs> I would say I was like in live chess with like four analysis boards. <laughs> but okay. Here's the Austrian. Um, I'll just grab these from here and bring them over to my live chess. Okay, and I will invite you guys to the board in live chess. Ah, so this is called Austrian, apparently. I didn't even know what it would be called. All right, so is this the first game or the second game? Let me see. I think this, this was the first game. Yeah. First game? Okay, cool. It just helps for me to, you know, read into your minds if I, if I read into them in the correct order. All right, so white takes the pawn on c5. Black pushes for space. Queen a5, fighting directly tactically with the queen white develops and accepts that black has a good center black looks like they might want to castle queen side quickly doesn't have time to save the bishop pair just has the center there and here now white wants to just shred it if they can Surprising. Black happily castles. Position super complicated. White maybe threatens rook d6. Mm, oh. Is white not threatening rook d6? Uh, he is. <laughs> yes, yeah. And then I just too quickly played the other one. Yeah. I mean, you have to see that, like, even if the queen goes to one of these squares, you got bishop c4, but. Yeah, okay. So, peace here, here, here. Oh, and now you did it. I know I did it. Yeah. And now you did it. And with bishop c4. Okay. And white wins the game. I actually had a tactic to get out of that. With right here? H2. No, after rook e6, I had bishop h2. Right here? Uh, Back two more moves. The first rook to e6. Ah, Impossibly right away here? Still there. Uh, right here. Oh, right away. Yeah, instead of rook e8. Oh, that's like that's really savage that move actually, right? Yeah. Then I get because H5 um, check. yeah, a white sort of trapped their queen on the queen side. They've got very very few defenders, right? Are you guys yeah. watching the video just now? A little bit, bits and pieces. Yeah. So white king's got almost no defenders, right? So actually, yeah, if you see that you can switch the queen here, that that would be savage. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's mate. Yeah, I. Uh... I was trying to calculate it in the game, and I didn't see that I was controlling that file, which is why I didn't play it. But mm -hmm. if I had seen that element of it, I would have played it immediately. Right, you've got the rook here. I yeah. thought I could. I thought when we looked at it in the postmortem, yeah. I could save it. Really, yeah, it's not. Oh. I don't think it's mate. It but looks it's like, like mate. It gets me out of all the scariness. Okay, of queen h five. Mm -hmm. Then king g one. Then knight g four. Then bishop takes h7 back, followed by queen h3. Oh. Nice. That's good. That is good. Yeah. I mean, black wins. <laughs> yeah. But they don't checkmate just yet, right? I mean, they could take on c2 and then d2 yeah. to be up a piece. A funny, funny result of like sacking a piece. Um, yeah, okay, that's a cool example. Maybe I'll use that in my course. And then we also this. looked at earlier. I should have played b4 when his king was still in the center, mm -hmm. just to disrupt the. Like I think we're looking. Oh, like right here instead here? of f4, or after yeah. f4, bishop d6 with the bishop f4. like. Dangly here. here. This is like typical for this yeah, structure. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. 
That's pretty strong. Yeah, I looked at it for about a minute or so, and uh -huh. I thought that my knight on a3 would be hanging at the end of stuff. Yep, I bet no, it I would be, but... <laughs> Yeah. I don't think it was actually if I remember our analysis correctly. Okay. Yeah, we found that before was crushing, which is what I thought he was gonna play in the game. Yeah. And then he went queen b three. And yeah. then I also calculated that my a six was totally unnecessary. So. Yeah, I think that's really you know, I wasn't I was going through fast enough that I wasn't like looking what the better moves are for you two, but like when I saw Queen B three, I was like, Oh, black's happy to see that, right? <laughs> like yeah. like is all white trying to get out of Black's King being uncastled the B seven pawn? Sure. Have it, you know. But also, yeah, I noticed with knight A three, I was like, I'm not sure why this made black play A six, you know. I thought you were gonna castle Queenside when I saw you play Bishop E six. If yeah, I were reading, I if I were reading about. moves, yeah. right? Like I'm playing a game, my opponent plays bishop e6. I'm like, well, he's definitely not trying to castle kingside, because <laughs> you know white can already play ed4, ed4, rook e1, right? And you're not developing a kingside piece. I'd be like, huh? It's going yeah, queenside. I think for me, it was more just creating an immediate threat on c4. Was the reason I played bishop e6 mm. over other moves? There's no when way a6, you're threatening I that pawn. There's no way you're threatening it. Yeah. Well, I want, I don't know. I wanted him to deal with that. I wanted him to play B3 is what I wanted him to play. Well, yes. No. I would love if my opponents would, like, <laughs> play B3. But but remember, when you're... It, so, basically, the situation is you're down in development here, right? You're down yeah. in development, and you're trying to use the threat on C4 to catch up in development, right? You want to play yep. Bishop B6, they play B3, and you get Knight F6, and you're like, I got a piece out for free. Right. Right? understand that your threats need to be like pretty compelling in that sort of situation like if you're down in development threatening a pawn is almost never going to be enough to make your opponent defend it yeah. right like if there are other options to keep getting ahead in development yeah so if you're behind in development you need to threaten at least a piece if you want to like be pretty sure your opponent's going to have to respect your threat. So knight f6 for the fork. Oh yeah. <laughs> you even have a good developing move that has a threat. Yeah. <laughs> now that's something that I might not be able to just play, you know, whatever move I want. Right. Right. Um, you know, but it's, def it's definitely complicated. With probably I do something like this, right. And then rookie one, which should be seven. Yeah. And again, like B4 is going to be the key move sure. to try and get something going. And, you know, who knows if it's going to be enough or not. The other thing you can do sometimes in these positions is play like Bishop E6 and be willing to like lose one pawn when they go here. There's some examples of that. Like Knight here okay. and then you castle, right? And they get back like one pawn. And then you go here with this like Knight G4 kind of stuff again, right? Or queen right. to the king side or something um but yeah you need to in general if you're behind in development and you threaten to win a pawn like your opponent's just gonna be like whatever i don't need to defend pawns against somebody who's behind in development okay um so this move was like risky he defends the pawn but while also developing um and here yeah i think you should castle right based on what you've done so far i was afraid of might might be five yeah. bishop c7 and having to deal with that but like i realized afterwards that i don't have to play six i can mm -hmm. just develop knight f6 yeah um and then if he plays knight before then i just play rook c8 and that's mm -hmm have a piece that i missed yeah i mean he might be able to and you could also spend a move getting your king off the c file um yeah, i just didn't think about queen side castling i don't know why hmm. okay yeah um, so i misread bishop e6 yeah. um okay yeah so i think i think knight f6 would be like a very interesting position um you know, queen a5 to c5 is a little bit risky, right? That's why you're sort of like scrambling to catch up in development now. Right. 
it's like a bit risky but like you're controlling d4 and bishop d2 is not very aggressive so you're like hoping that white doesn't really have like punch right they've got a little development lead but maybe they don't have like the punch to to do something with it right um baron when there's a fight over a pair of squares like d4 and e5 then b4 b5 and g5 g4 are common themes right and if the fight were over the other pair of squares like e4 and d5 then you'll see a lot of those openings will have black playing b5 b4 and white playing g4 g5 kicking the pieces the knights that fight very well for those pairs of squares so i guess you mentioned that you did think about b4 so it was on your horizon i think in this kind of position like b4 is your most punchy move your move that's most likely to start action um and that's even taking into account that you've got e takes d4 e takes d4 rookie one with an open e file on their king right I still think that open e-file on its own will do nothing without b4, b5 usually. It won't create enough of a threat. But with b4, b5 mixing with rookie one, oh, then you start to, then, then you've got like a couple ingredients to cook with, right? Then you've got like, you're kicking away the knight on c6 that defends the e7 bishop, like in, uh, like in this kind of position here, right? I had yeah. b4, right? If the queen goes like here, you know, b5, kicking away the queen that defends that, knight goes here, Bishop B4, like aiming at E7, like it's easy to start creating like good scenarios. I'm playing semi-random moves. Queen A4 just wins the knight. It's even easier, but you know, just to show you like how B4, B5 is like so integral to what's going on. So it's good that it was on your radar. Know that it's like, it's the real deal in this position. Yeah, immediately after the game, I confessed the embarrassment of Queen B3. Mm -hmm. that when we first started i was like wow queen b3 was a real lame yeah, that move. was that was the first words out of his mouth <laughs> yeah like, so lame and was and so part lame. of the instinct like seeing that move and just being like oh is i guess partly because it's like killing b4 b5 right like white's position is just kind of like a clod of dirt after queen b3 even though it's like increasing your development <laughs> it's like, right what, what's going on but yeah that nah, happens um what did you guys think overall of like the evaluation of the position let's say you know around the moment white's castling let's say we'll hold off on bishop e6 for the moment um what do you guys think black's got a bit of a center white's got a bit of a development lead do you guys have a clear sense of who's better or worse or is it uh within reason i thought white was maybe a little bit better but it wasn't very very clear Mm -hmm. I think it was, you know, close to equal, maybe slight edge for White, mm -hmm. just because they have a good lead in development. And even though White can, or Black can castle Queen's like quickly, I think that's a pretty dangerous place to be castling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The way I played Bishop e6 with Castle's Queen side is risky, but it's also logical. I have to say. Yeah. It's logical. It looks like it's walking into b4, b5. But honestly, after you've castled, you can consider playing knight takes b4 and taking that pawn. And you're castling, you're creating opposite side castle position when you're strong in the center. That that plays well together. Like, I think having like a strong center like that can be nice when you castle queen side. Um, and it's just playing to the fact that you've developed, you know, every queen side piece so far, right? So it's just it's just easier. So you do what's easier. Um, I think it's quite plausible to castle queen side. Finity, what's your like, you know, instinct or actually you guys have already talked about it. what's what's your sort of feeling of the evaluation? I was just glad to get my pawn back at this point, to be honest. Okay. Um yeah, I uh I just felt super underdeveloped and that's what I was worried about. Mm -hmm. Um and I was really worried about before coming and just stealing the initiative. So I thought White was doing perfectly fine. Yeah. Even with like my center, yeah, I thought his development advantage was just too strong. Yeah, I think it's very scary for Black like you. Um, I think you've got a good, you know, sense of like the initiative and when it's like possible to suddenly get an initiative and and do something with it. So I would say your instincts are right again on that. Um, you know, this is like the kind of position where White throws B four B five at the position and Black starts really 
struggling from the development uh, lead. So, yeah, I would say overall, I mean, maybe this whole opening I gave you is just bad for black, right? That's one possibility. But overall, this queen a5 to c5, even though the bishop's on d2, it still feels like very scary for black. Like high chances okay. of white achieving something. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't see anything like really bad about your moves, Paul, right? It's just, it's like a risky opening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's grab the next one. Okay, so this is the next game, and you chose a different approach of just bringing out pieces, yeah. as opposed to trying to like grab onto a pawn. Even though you liked Baron's position last game, you still went with like the idea that looked good to you. Yeah, it was our second game. I wanted to try other things, mm -hmm. exploring. Yeah, I was just exploring. Do you think it's like logical that this would be a good move? Yeah, because it fights for D four. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like it was more important to try to prevent him from getting something on d4 than anything else, which ended up, he ended up getting something on d4 anyway. But mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. So knight f6, knight c3, adding more pieces to the fight. And so now Baron trades first. The moment that you can't just play queen d4 because he's got knight c6 now and there's no queen d5, right? Which I think I still did play queen d4. Yeah. So let me think here. What if here you took on d5? What, what would happen there? Queen d5, knight c3 looks terrible for black, right? Yeah. And knight d5, e4 is actually very bad for black as well. I don't know if you instantly see this pattern, but you can do this, where you just push past. And this makes the c5 move very bad for black. So it, there's yeah, always a risk when you spend time grabbing e4 space. Is not hanging. There's always a risk when you spend time grabbing space, right? And here, you oh, know, okay. e4 is undefended. Um, Queen you know and it feels like risky that we're like operating off of like tricks like queen a4 or whatever right but what justifies the time white spent doing this is that this makes the move c5 so bad for black it makes that d5 pawn like basically a, a very strong candidate pass pawn it means you can't trade it off ever it blocks in your own bishop on f8 so it's reducing that piece's options um so it's just it's that's become such a wasted move that white will be able to you know easily and comfortably play knight c3 bishop to either c4 or d3 or e2 castle and just have a great game yeah okay so this would be like really really bad for black um and so if you play cd5 i think the only plausible move from black is that they play cd4 so Right. You know, then, then maybe, maybe blacks. Who knows, right? I mean, we don't know this opening. That's the only move that's logical. And then white doesn't have an obvious knockout, but they could play knight d4 or queen d4, and and the game would go on. Yep. Um. After you play knight c3, it looks like it makes the c takes d4 move a little bit better, right? Because yeah. on queen d4, there's knight c6. And your knight's attacked. If you go knight d5, knight d5, pawn d5, queen d5, that's nothing special. You played knight d4, black played e5, knight f3, d4. That went crazy. <laughs> oh, and it gets crazy. Wow. Okay. Like, I feel like this is very risky for white that black's going to be able to do the same thing I just showed white doing. Right. Um, and I would partly be inclined to try knight b5, and knight d5, but I think it just doesn't work, actually. Black trades one knight, doesn't fall for knight c7, but plays a6 now. And if white has to play knight a3, 
Didn't they just have Queen A5, right? White's in the trash. Oh my god, it's already yeah, over. Queen yeah. yeah, Queen A5. Okay, this is super critical then. Yeah, super critical. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Looks scary. Yeah, it's, it's bad. <laughs> That's why I went for the sack. <laughs> Looks scary. So you go for the sack. Now, pawn takes knight, queen takes queen is probably at least okay for white. Even if the knight gets trapped, you'll have gotten enough material for the material to be equal. Yep. So bishop d6. Now, if you retreat your knight, you lose a piece. If you move the other knight, you lose a piece. It looks like you're genuinely forked here. If you play queen a4 check, though, black has to move the king, right? Because they don't want to trade the knight on e5. So if you go queen a4, black's going to play king f8, and then I guess you still lose your piece, huh? Yeah. Okay, that doesn't look particularly better than, than what you did. So, okay, so you come here, 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 here. You've got three pawns for the... This was very, very good choice, Paul. Very good choice. Yeah, it, we when we looked at the game afterwards, we found out it was just because bishop to d6 was a bad response. Oh, really? Yeah, there's... Instead of bishop d6, I think it was queen... Queen c7? Queen, queen, queen d6. Queen d6, I think really? is what we said. Queen d6, okay. I would have thought maybe queen c7, so on check, you can go here and your queen's still covering knight f7. Might give me time to free my knight, though, right? In that line? How so? There's still two knights attacked. Uh, although knight b5 mm -hmm. is bad all right <laughs> yeah. okay so bishop d6 here 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 now you probably wanted to put your queen like on h4 but you made a better choice you just came back yeah that's nice partly because like knight b4 could be super annoying if your queen's not there and partly because you don't want your queen in front of your pawns anyway in this kind of a position it's not helpful you actually want to like you know squish them with pawns and then follow up with pieces and then the queen you don't want her out there you're not like attacking you're just developing so bishop g4 h3 i would think you would want to play f3 e4 instead oh black's just getting so far ahead in development again Ooh. Yeah, that's... and then my mouse slipped and then I was like hold on let's replay from that position Yeah. and then I looked at the position and I was like never mind let's so not like... replay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey wait Chad has a really good question also why not queen d4 after bishop d6 looks way better it defends both the knights That would also be after yeah, queen c7. So that's why you guys remember that queen d6 was like the move that you figured out in calculation. Because queen yeah, c7, probably. there's the same move, just queen d4. Oops. So that's why you have to go queen d6. You have to keep d4 defended. And then on queen a4, maybe the move's like king e7 to try and like win that piece. But black's definitely contorting themselves to win that piece, right? I mean. Maybe it all works out. But, like, bishop f4 threatens knight g6. How do you take? This looks really risky for black, honestly, as well. This line. It's very complicated. Um, and then I'm threatening to castle, too. Yeah, you're getting ready to castle queenside. <laughs> Suddenly, like, my king's on e7. I need to win a lot of material here in a hurry. <laughs> huh. I feel like we looked at this. 
I don't think we looked at Queen A4, but I mm -hmm. think there, oh, yeah, be, without there has to be something better than King E7. What if I just play the other knight to D7? Because I can guarantee you King D8's worse. What if I just do this, though? Okay, so now white trades this. And then saves this. A6. Well, first of all, the rook's undefended. And second of all, the queen's threatened with check. So white's like got like too uh, tempy to save this knight, like plenty of time. Like when this queen moves off of d6, white could either move their queen, or they could even play bishop f4. They could just leave the knight on b5, ignore the whole deal. Play queen a5, maybe, threatening knight c7 with the queen. I mean, black's position is probably fine, right? They're going to get better development than white here, but white's not losing a piece, and they're up a pawn. So you've got a very interesting game going. Um, Maybe black just plays like <clears throat> queen b4 check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just take these off, take this yeah. off. You know, go here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Send the white king back here awkwardly. This knight's pretty good, right? And then maybe trade that off too and go rook here. Yeah. Right? Great compensation for the pawn, right? I mean, just totally totally reasonable respectable logical position for black that said i mean i think all of this says that paul when you recognize that like e5 and like d4 was coming that there were problems i think you made like a really good choice to go to like roll the dice into this knight e5 it seems like a very good very good try i thought he just lost his mind <laughs> you thought what? He just lost his mind? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I was a little, I mean, I I looked at the other the alternative and it seemed worse and I thought that this would at least cause complications. Um Yeah, no, I mean, you got to you got to have that sense of when things are going wrong and try and like switch things and be open to doing like dramatic things if things are going dramatically badly for you. I didn't think they were going dramatically bad for him. I thought after he sacked the piece on F7, uh, the uh -huh. next move, that's when I thought, he, oh, man, he's just he's just gone crazy. No, but, I mean, what's he supposed to do instead of that? Like, I don't like know. The, the, the situation's <laughs> much worse than you realize, I think. Like, what else was Paul supposed to do if not 95 here? Like, we already looked at... Um, we looked at that other line with knight B5, right, where... We lost a piece immediately, so that wasn't it. With the knight on f3, you could play knight d5 and lose a pawn for absolutely nothing, right? That looks bad. You could play knight b1, and then after knight c6, there's already threat of e4, which is going to send this knight to g1 as well. Um, I mean, white might already be lost. Like, it's, it's, real, it's really dramatic already. Normally, you'd, like... To avoid this, you have to control one of these squares, right? So then you have to play e3. But often, like, e3 fails like like this, right? When you haven't yet... When you've played c4, <laughs> you haven't yet castled, right? And then something like here, you know, here, here, here. I think... Black just won temporarily two pawns for nothing, but very importantly, white's development is still bad. Even with queens off the board, right? Your king can't castle and your development's bad. I would say that's probably lost. But, I mean, you really have an incentive to challenge with e3. I suppose you could just take back with the f pawn and try and play this position, but that's... <laughs> no, 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 I, I'm saying that I thought knight takes e5 was fine. Because when oh. he played it, I was like, oh, shoot. Okay. But when I thought he lost his mind is when I knight played f bishop d6 and he went knight takes oh, f7. Okay. So what did I you think he would he... do? What did you think he would do at this point? I thought he'd probably try a sub queen a4. Ah, uh, okay. Stuff. You're thinking or... queen a4. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so you you I understood that d4. that it was maybe time for knight e5, but you just didn't think knight f7 was doing it. Yeah. Yeah. 95 was just a complete shock and when he played it, i was like oh man i i can't believe i 
didn't think about that when right. I just slammed out D4. Let me try one different move for Finity for like one moment just to see if we can get a different feeling if we try to develop faster for him. So I'll go F3 against this bishop. Here at that bishop H5 and... Right. Now, if black can, like, win with, like, knight h5 or something, you know, and queen h4, then it would say, you know, I, I was so far behind in development that threatening a bishop doesn't even matter anymore, right? But, um... Can they enter bishop h5? Probably not quite, because, like, queen d5 check. If the bishop blocks, we can take the knight, right? And if the king moves, that at least stops the rook from coming out. <clears throat> Now we can take this and on queen h4, play g3 and our queen's covering h1. It probably doesn't quite work for black. I made flight squares for the king too. Okay, so I go f3, you play bishop h5, I play e4 for white. What does black do? So one thing you could look to do, Baron, is put your bishop on c5 to prevent castling. I'll say this. If you just play, like, you know, rook e8, bishop e2, king g8, castles, like, it's unclear. It's unclear. You've got a development lead right now. That's your real advantage. Yeah. It's not the piece against three pawns. It's the development lead. So you want to make something of it. So you kind of want to play like queen b6 or bishop c5 without somehow trading queens or hanging the bishop. So that's kind of like the tricky thing to think about for a moment here. Maybe queen c7 would threaten bishop h2 and give you time to bother him with rook d8 and stuff. I was worried about looking at this. If I play bishops or a queen c7, what about the annoying kind of knight d5? Mm -hmm. nice it, it doesn't make sense to trade queens here i mean you can if you've got no other option it's it's just not your preference because you're trying to use a development lead to checkmate the white king in the center that's basically black's plan here okay so first of all in general like knight against three pawns like the knight's not going to outclass three pawns in a lot of end games often it'll be worse sometimes equal yeah, um, i was just thinking should be so in general when you've got a piece against pawns you want to win in the middle game add to that that you've got a development lead and the white's king hasn't castled you've got a lot of incentive to um to try and play it like like an attacking position already so okay queen c7 knight b5 didn't work this move looks super artificial but how about queen b8 i know now i'm playing for white or black so what am i trying to prove i don't know but <laughs> queen b8 g3 bishop c5 oh there's not a there's not a bishop stack on g3 yeah, i was gonna i think you can just can you just stack on g3 you could because yeah, if you force the king to the you could file, but i'm block. gonna like win without even striking a blow but yeah you're right this wins you just come here check 95 94 i guess king here bishop here i guess this probably wins for black but you do have to calculate a little bit yeah i was i was just gonna play like bishop c5 you know bishop here rook d8 you know queen somewhere knight d4 isn't this just this is just easy right you just move around white's pawn structure you never have to sack or trade anything what if instead of g3 i play never mind yeah it's tough <laughs> it's tough so i mean i think the development lead is, is pretty scary here yeah. um so yeah Okay, but it's interesting, but it's interesting. 
Yeah, bishop takes d1 is bishop captures d1, Lucifer. You were saying that instead of f3, white should have played e3. And the reason why we were looking at h3 and f3 in this position is e3, bishop takes queen. So white needs to develop the bishop here, and that's why we're looking at these moves. Oh, I thought you were going to show me I could play f3. I was like, uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's... 33, right there. Yeah. Just some question coming in from chat. All right. What about G, G3? Right. G3 is, is a way to maybe shot. develop without making any more pawn moves than necessary, which... Indeed, I mean, it's you don't want to be making pawn moves for sure. Um, yeah, that looks a bit better, definitely. This is going to get risky, but like here, here. Here, ninety four. This was risky. <laughs> I don't like staking it all on a calculation here, but yeah. I think this probably works out for black. If white castles, we take here with check. And on king f1, you can now trade on d2, queen here, rook here. And we've disrupted white's, white's game. Yeah, I think it probably doesn't quite pan out, but it looks like you had that queen takes d4 move. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really wish I had seen that. So, it so it lot. does look like your 95 was very interesting. You know, um, I think that was a that was a good way mm -hmm. to play that. Very very interesting idea, and it shows how like how complicated chess can get within like seven moves. Now and then it just like explodes, right? It's just like yeah. whoa. <laughs> Like each player was trying to do something logical, but it was somehow confrontational and and then it explodes. So very cool. All right. Here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to um I give you guys I uh, a couple questions here. Uh, some opening questions. Okay, so let's see. Let's see if I can invite you to this other board here. Does that show up as an invite or not? I don't know if that board is has been timed out. No, I didn't see one. Didn't? Okay, it's fine. I'll grab the PGN and carry it over. <laughs> Okay, so now it's on the board we were already on. Okay. So I'm giving you Scandinavian defense with like a slightly unusual move for black, and I'm just curious what your reaction to that move is, okay? So, okay, knight c3, queen a5, knight f3, and now knight c6. Do you guys know this position before knight c6 like is this within your general sense of chess i don't mean like you know like a bunch of opening theory but does this position look like oh yeah i know what this is oops i was muted i got one system against scandinavian mm -hmm. that i play and, and what's it, that it's just knight f3 bishop e2 d3 in the castles without knight c3 or with knight c3 uh, knight c3 first because knight c3 kind of, first okay there's no reason not to queen a5 knight f3 so you would play this exact position here yeah at this yeah, point i think sometimes i play okay. bishop e2 first cool because they want to develop their bishop and it can put it on an awkward square but mm -hmm. same idea okay 
yeah. So um, so this position, like, it makes sense to you. You know what's going on, right? Like, Black's playing the Scandinavian. You traded a pawn. Um, they're trying to develop their bishop on c8 freely and eliminate your central pawn on e4, right? Remove your space advantage. Right. Um, the cost is, you know, one queen move, not the end of the world. Um, especially since white spends a move playing pawn takes pawn on d5, right? So one of the things that some Scandinavian players are kind of arguing is that the knight on c3 blocks the c2 pawn. And so that tempo from knight c3 is not like amazing because if white plays d4, they're going to want to play c3 or c4 just in most of most positions with the pawn on d4, right? You'd want the c right. pawn to either defend it or control d5 if you're if you've got the ambition or if you've got the power to play more ambitiously. Okay, so that's kind of like a big part of the idea of the Scandinavian. It's just that like knight c3 is like a tempo, but like it's actually not that good because um, of blocking the c pawn. Okay, um, so with that orientation, uh, do you guys know that normally what black plays here is like knight f6, c6, and the bishop to either f5 or g4? Yes. Is yeah. That, yeah. That's your experience too. And Paul, your idea of playing d3, it's kind of like logical. The pawn is staying with the c2 pawn, right? Like you're not getting yeah. ahead of it. You're not doing anything like risky. Yep. You know. It's passive, but it's passive. Solid. Your bishop on e2 is not particularly good. But if your yeah. opponent goes and plays bishop g4, then actually the bishop e2 will be well placed. Right. That's an example of like, you know, reading a position like badly. Like from Black's perspective, if you played like bishop e2 here and Black goes like bishop g4, you don't even have a pawn on d4 for them to pressure, right? You're going to play d3. Like, the best thing that could happen to your bishop on e2 is that either it comes to f3, or at some point the knights move and you trade for the bishop on g4 with your bishop on e2, right? So yep. bishop g4 would be, like, a very, very bad move in this position. It's not reading what white's doing, and it's one of these, like, false aggressive moves that some people who, like, want to play aggressively will just always, like, put their piece the furthest forward they can. Um, even if it just leads to a bad trade. Uh, it's also a tactical liability because the bishop's just like dangling there. Like, um, you know, say white castles, you might want to play the move e5 as black if your opponent's not playing d4. And now, you know, it probably loses to like knight e5 or something. Yeah, it just takes. Right, just because you've like, you know, added in risk factors you didn't need to. So, I mean loses is a strong word but it's not good <laughs> so it's just it's just like it's just pure downside to have that bishop on that square when you don't want to trade it on f3 you don't want to trade it on e2 and it's just like on a square where it's hanging anyway so in this game instead of playing knight f6 c6 like you'll see most people play black plays knight c6 okay so as white how do you react to knight c6 what do you read into this move what moves does it make you want to play more or less when you see this move uh, well i got my one system so it doesn't really change anything but no 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 systems <laughs> It kind of makes me want to play d4 a little more because it, it makes takes you play. away the e5 square. It fights over e5. Okay. I don't know if that's so the right thought. It makes you want to play d4 a little bit more because they don't have the pawn on c6 to stop d5? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm threatening to take more space, which is d5 immediately. Right. I mean, he's defending it. He can defend against it, but that's not the point. Okay, cool. So the fact that black doesn't have the pawn that can come to c6, and instead they've got a knight on c6, it encourages you to maybe go d4 looking at d5. Yeah, but then I feel like I get hit with bishop f5, and then... Bishop f5, and then you're afraid of, like, d5, knight b4 or something? Knight b4, yeah, all that stuff. Okay, you're white. You can't fear that. Uh, Baron, your thoughts on this position? Uh, I think... D4 seems like a really strong move, and 
I know when I play the against the Scandinavian, the annoying setup of e6 and c6 is frustrating to play against. So when they play knight c6, I thought that looks kind of weird because now they're going to have a harder time to get c6 in along with e6. Mm -hmm. So it seems like knight c6 is inaccurate. Okay. Um, do either oh, of you have a sense of why your opponent's playing knight c6? Is it the Probably idea they want that to play e5? Okay, they're trying to play e5 maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe bishop e5 might make sense as a move here too. Okay. With yeah, if you play of... bishop b5, how do you expect your opponent would respond to that? Maybe maybe bishop d7 mm -hmm. and then castles and then they're fine. So. Right. And how do you feel about that trade of moves? Is that like helping or hurting or or equal? probably hurting because it's just advancing their development and they get to continue with their plan of e5 okay i think it hurts because i feel like black wants the castle queen side mm -hmm. so you're right. more or less just forcing them up to what they want to do okay all right my take on this knight c6 move is that black is looking for a very rapid development without normal central structure from their pawns okay and they're deliberately putting their pieces on risky squares in favor of just pure like pieces coming out fast and like tactical possibilities okay so their idea is that they're going to go bishop g4 to fight for d4 and that they're going to go castles queenside as quickly as possible so the rook fights against d4 and the queen and even if you play d5 they're not going to move the knight they're going to play rook they're going to bring the rook to d8. Right. And then try and play like knight f6, e6, and deal with your pawn when it's already there. Okay. So if that's the case, does bishop b5, bishop d7 play into black's plans or not? No, because now I can play d4 and his right. bishop's on the wrong square. Yes. It doesn't play into black's plans because the bishop on d7 is blocking the rook on d8. And although white doesn't want to trade on c6, white's not forced to trade on c6. If black spends a move on like a6 or something like that, you can always later retreat your bishop to e2 or something. And a6 will have weakened the position of their king because they're castling over there, right? Um, so, um, yeah, basically I played D4 this game, but I think Bishop B5 might actually be cleverer and smarter than D4 as I played because D4 goes right into what black wants to do with Bishop to G4. But if you play Bishop B5, that's asking black quite a question about Bishop to G4, right? Yeah, and it's weird because now you're now you're threatening like knight d5 b4. It's very strange position. Yes, by cutting off the queen here, one of the biggest problems with knight c6 versus c6. Not that like knight c6 is bad, right? But it's got its pluses and minuses. One of the biggest minuses is the queen from a5 can't go to c7. So, in the main lines where black plays, let's say knight f6 d4 c6, you don't really trap this queen, like ever, right? And you don't spend a lot of energy trying to do it. Not many people try to play like a3, b4 in these positions because the queen can always go to c7. Right? And, H5 and, and bishop d2 gets played a lot, but it's not a big deal because the queen just goes back. Yeah. Right? But with knight c6, if you play bishop b5, this queen's like quite hemmed in, right? Because the knight can't get out of the way of the c pawn and she can't transfer across the fifth rank anymore. Yeah. yeah. So let's say black plays bishop g4. For one thing, you don't have a pawn hanging on d4, which may be part of the reason why Paul sometimes plays with d3, right? But like here, yeah. it's nice that we're avoiding a pawn on d4, right? There's not... If the opponent castles queenside, there won't actually be pressure on anything. Yeah. 
and you'll be able to take on c6 and their king position will be weak finally with this move where i think h3 is probably pretty strong here too because you know bishop takes on f3 queen takes on f3 i don't know this looks critical for black already c6 is just hanging So at this point, white's ahead in development, and white has a threat, and white has the bishop pair, and black has no pressure on d4 because there's no pawn on d4, and their queen is weirdly placed. So it's going like super, super badly at this point. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you figured out that's what your opponent wants to do, if you figure out that like the point of knight c6 is bishop g4, Imagine if they keep playing their system moves, Paul. <laughs> Imagine right. if they go bishop g4, and then like the next thing they do is they castle queenside too. Because they're like, I don't know what else to do. It's too, too buttons hanging. Right? So now you could do this. You could take f7 if you want to weaken their light squares. You could come here if you want to. Like, great. Yeah. And, of course, you're going to put your pawn on d3, not d4 now. In general, I'm not pumped about you playing d3 with your bishop on f1 and then bishop e2. But in this position, you traded that bishop. Your opponent controls yeah. d4. And d4 would only block your c1 bishop, right? So put the pawn on d3. And it's, you know, winning advantage already. So alternatively, bishop g4, h3. We could go bishop back to h5, right? And now white probably has the justification to go g4, bishop g6, knight e5. Again, you're going to be very happy, Paul. Again, we're going to play d3, not d4, right? Right. Because we're playing against that bishop on g6. We're saying, like, technically black developed that piece, but gosh, it would be better off on c8. It's so restricted and, and low on options, right? Furthermore, we've got queen f3 coming, so we're winning a pawn for sure. And if we go back to that question about queenside castling being risky in one of your games, but I was like, well, blacks developed all their queenside pieces. They kind of just have to do it, even though it looks risky. Right. Even though white has b4, b5. Well, I mean, black's a little bit in that kind of a situation here where white's about to win a pawn on the queenside. Not just, like, hurt your pawn structure, not just win a pawn. They're going to, like, win a pawn of your pawn cover. And in this position as black, you're like, hmm, maybe I just need to castle queenside here. Yeah. It's like, what else are you going to do? Play like e6, white plays queen f3, right? And it's like, you know, or I guess knight c6 might win a whole rook now because you didn't castle. Okay. So this position might be so bad for black that they castle queenside into white taking on c6. Might win a queen. Things can go really, really badly here for black at this point, right? Mm. So I think bishop b5 is kind of like a genius move here. I didn't play it, but I would expect black to play bishop d7. And I'm going to stay flexible with the d pawn here. I'll castle. If black ever plays e5, by the way, <laughs> Dripman was asking about this a little bit in chat, in these lines where you delay d4, but you haven't spent a tempo on d3 either, you've been developing fast, and your opponent's like, oh, I can play e5 because white didn't play d4. Whenever they do, you can almost always just play d4 for white. And then black's like, oh, oops. Like, I'm behind in development, and I just tore open the center, right? They, like, maybe falsely think white's going to be passive because white didn't play d4, but it's just a move order trick. So white castles here, you know, and if black plays a move like a6, like I'm okay retreating now, right? I didn't lose time. Bishop d7 wasn't good for them. a6 wasn't good for them, right? You can go to c4 or e2 here, and it's fine. Does that make sense? Does a4 make sense? Bishop a4? Playable too, sure. I mean, honestly, you can even play b4 here. Very logical. <laughs> Maybe the best move. <laughs> that would really show like how useful our flexibility was, right? Yeah. Uh, so on knight b4, then bishop d7, and the king's in the middle of the board. And if you count tempies, like white also has enough tempi in addition to the fact that black's king is exposed. 
Um, and if queen b4, right, then it's like more tempi with rook b1. Queen back. Bishop c4, and now there's a tempo on b7, and it's like, what are you going to do? Black castle queen inside? <laughs> I guess so. It's the only thing your position can do, unfortunately, even though you don't want to do it. So. Hangs f7. And it hangs f7, so white's going to have no no commitment really right like white hasn't risked anything yeah so actually this b4 move looks like further genius right it's another good good find after bishop b5 so i think bishop b5 would be great probably and i just you know wasn't sure what i wanted to about knight c6 and just played like a normal d4 move the idea of bishop b5 had already occurred to me but i just played a normal d4 move and my opponent played bishop g4 like i knew they would and i was like oh d5 castles queen side you know like bishop e2 castles queen side and the d4 pawn is threatened i don't know if you've ever seen this kind of stuff before but like if you play defensively for white sometimes it just doesn't work out at all right yeah like they just start attacking d4 and you're like man i'm playing a lot of passive moves and black's whole setup is justified at this point you're not trying to trap their queen. You didn't win a tempo on the knight on c6. And they're actually getting something out of the rook versus queen opposition. So you just look at like what each side has tried to do. It seems like what black was trying to do has like worked out, right? The moves have played towards what black wanted. Yeah. This has happened to you at some point, Baron, that someone played an offbeat Scandinavian like this and you didn't feel great. Oh, yes. Yeah. I've gotten absolutely crushed right. with this kind of Just stupid stuff on stuff. the D file, right? And you're like, oh, yeah. it's janky. Yeah. What am I supposed to do? So, yeah, I mean, one thing you want to do is not go, like, passive. You have to, like, fight back. And that sometimes means, like, um, like calculating a variation, like, you know, bishop e3, or sorry, like, it would be something like, you know, d5, castles, you know, maybe like bishop d2, creating this threat and like knight b5. Sometimes you have to just calculate if that thing works, right? Other times you do something like bishop e3, like e6 challenging you, and you just take, you know, here and here. Sometimes you just have to like let loose. You just have to go for something. Yeah. Um, You have to find like what they're doing has its downsides, right? As well as its strong sides. If all you do is try and defend against the strong point of what they're doing and you don't look for the the achilles heel or the soft underbelly or you know you don't look for the like the weakness and try and emphasize that then people can run over you right and when i've played my like riskier aggressive openings against gms like they never just like defend the stuff they just like spot the place where they can counterattack, right like every time one of my you know, two aggressive openings has been punished, it's because they lashed out at me. Never because they just, like, defended it. So, um, so bishop to g4 was played by black. And, um, yeah, what do you guys think white should do now? You're now well oriented to this position, but it's still somewhat new. Trying to see if bishop b5 still works here. Uh -huh. Bishop b5 castles takes. Right. Okay. Maybe bishop b5. Still. So you're thinking maybe bishop b5. Maybe that finds like a weakness in this like knight c6 kind of thing. Yeah. Now, is some part of you afraid 
Then after you go bishop b5, castles queenside, and destroy their pawn structure, they're going to throw c5 at you and e5 at you, and like your light squares will be weak and the rook will become active. Is some part of you scared about this option? Always. Always. <laughs> How about you, Baron? Does that... Do, do you have... How do you feel about the possibility of bishop b5 castles and then you take on c6? I think I'd be pretty happy. As You'd be well. happy to just do it. Okay, yeah. good. You guys don't have too much fear. A lot of people, like, if the situation's, like, complicated and double-edged and it's not one they know, they're just, like, they're fearing everything. Yeah. You know? But you have to be willing to just say, like, yeah, there's, like, pluses and minuses, but I'm going for this thing. You know? So I think the only good move here is is still bishop b5, even as it was on the previous move. Okay. The opponent castles. What should white do? Okay. I think you're right. Now what should white do? It's either d5 or bishop to e3. Bishop e3 develops peace. I was thinking just castle kingside. Uh, castles king side and then bishop takes. Oh, I guess f7 is hanging, huh? As is c6. But I'd be more concerned about castle king side than something like queen h5. You're concerned about castles queen h5, maybe? Yeah. But that's usually kind of annoying in my experience. Mm hmm. But castles queen h5, then maybe I'd probably be more inclined to do something like bishop e3. What about what about h3? Ah, uh, before castling, bishop. you're saying, right? Yeah, h3 and then castles. Um, not bishop e3. Yeah, just h3. Do they have the annoying queen h5 still? Yeah. Guess they do. Okay, let's just take six. Yeah, maybe bishop e3 to defend the pawn. Um, or I thought d5 was interesting because neither the rook nor the queen want to be on that square so like at the very beginning here d5 yeah just d5 here it's a little weird but because if he takes the pawn back he's got a pawn on that square and you shut off the rook even though it's like reconnecting his pawns and those pawns are just going to shut up the board mm -hmm. thought it was a little interesting interesting if you want to do that paul i would keep that in mind as an option and wait for your opponent to play e5 or c5 because have you guys thought about what move black wants to play next? Probably Baron suggested e queen h5 is an answer to some of white's moves. That's a good move. What else might black do? e5. e5. Their most likely move is e5. So if you're like open to a d5 pawn sack, I would say like set it up and let your opponent spend a move attacking d4 and then and then sack it. Okay, I'll give you like another minute and then um, tell me like what move you'd like to play for white.
Okay, what do you want? Queen to d3. Okay. Baron? I was thinking queen d3 too. Amazing. <laughs> you guys did better than me. Um, the two best moves in this position are queen d3 and queen e2. And the move I played in this position was h3. I recognize that what black really wants to do is play e5. Um, which maybe you guys did as well. Um, what black really wants to do is like play e5 and then probably like take on d4 with the pawn, but also just like develop their pieces at some point here, right? From the king side. It's what they really want to play. Now, I realize like h3 bishop takes queen takes like rook takes d4 doesn't help black much at all actually like right. your knight is still fine on c3 your bishop's going to come to e3 you know whether or not you take back a pawn on c6 or f7 which you know you're welcome to do if you want like even if you don't take back your pawn like it's just an amazing position for white because the black king is weak and white just develops so there's no threat of black taking the pawn on d4 with their pieces, actually. That, that, that pressure's kind of gone with bishop takes c6, right? Yeah. But I just missed this resource of, resource of queen h5. And that's just like the best position that black could have uh, could have gotten out of this, you know? Because now they're going to get to trade off on f3 and live to play an endgame. White's got like a small edge, but like the main like advantage is already gone. So not to reveal too much, but with your move, you would have like a big advantage, queen d3. Because you're happy to allow bishop f3, queen f3. It's funny, right? You're just like, whatever. And um, otherwise, if black goes e5, you can probably take it with your knight, right? Is that what you had? Yep. What you had planned? So you've stopped that. If black goes c5, I think you can just like push past them now. And, you know, black can, like, fight against you with, like, e6 and stuff, but it's just not, it's just not going to work out for them. You're going to be ahead in development, and their king's going to be weak. So after queen d3, there's, I mean, there's just not really anything good for black to do. Good job, guys. That's a sweet move. Um, and then queen e2 is very similar, right? Now, queen e2, I, didn't, I don't understand this one. I mean, you're avoiding e5 because you can take it with your d-pawn. And again, bishop f3, queen f3, rook d4, you're happy to play. And if just rook d4 right away. And if just rook d4 right away, um, then I think you just castle and just say whatever. Okay. Right? And again, you're going to play... Yeah, you know, bishop e3 and and actually probably rook d1 to trade their rook. Yeah, that makes sense. Because so you'll first get a tempo with bishop e3, then a7 will be hanging, which will be slightly annoying for them. Without a b7 pawn, you can really take a7 in any position without getting trapped, right? Yep. So their queen might have to sit there defending a7. They can never switch over queen h5, that tricky move against h3 and stuff, because you've positioned for queen a6 to release the pin and then use your knight. Right. Um, so you go bishop e3 to get the tempo. They retreat their rook. Um, and then you go rook d1. You trade the rook before h8 is connected, and then you just kind of roll over the position. Yeah, the funny thing is if black's king is weak and white's ahead in development, like rook takes d4 helps white more than black. Like it's taking a pawn, but it's kind of like helping white. Right. Which is, you know, a cool realization that you two was were sort of getting a little bit there, right, with the queen f3 variations. Um. So, yeah. So those would be good moves. And it's weird because normally you would think bishop f4, bishop e3, castles would be like the three like surface candidate moves, I think. Yeah. Right? Bishop e3, if you're like, oh, I'll just be like solid about d4. But again, like the danger is black putting a pawn on d4. A bishop on e3 doesn't like, <laughs> doesn't match up well with a black pawn coming to d4. Yeah. 
So, like, bishop e3, which looks, like, so well-intentioned after e5, like, I don't even want to play white. Just one move. Yeah. Um, and uh, just simple castles doesn't do anything about queen h5 or e5. <laughs> so, that's not it. Bishop f4 looks more plausible, but after queen f5, black probably still sort of survives the worst of it, I would say. Bishop f4 is probably definitely better than bishop e3 in castles, but not amazing. Okay. But interesting, I mean, if you look at, like, what could possibly happen, it's e5. And that made me want to go, like, h3, right? Because if black takes, I thought I would be winning. And if black retreats, I thought I'd play g4 and also be winning. And it turns out I'm right about that. And my opponent didn't play queen h5, and therefore h3 wins. <laughs> <laughs> So we both missed queen h5. But it's true that if black takes on f3, they're losing. And if black retreats to h5, they're losing as well. I guess that's what they played in the game. I played g4, bishop, g6, knight e5, right? And okay. <laughs> black black can resign as well. So, um, so the first thing is being able to see that black wants to play e5. Right? And then the second thing is noticing this queen h5 resource. If you notice that being a good resource against like h3, um, then you can come up with one of these queen moves. You just like the only problem is this e5 move, and now I found a move that deals with it. And either of those queen moves, I mean, it's weird, but they're like almost winning moves, basically, like strategically. I was trying to figure out where I placed my queen after bishop f5 but i guess that queen e2 yeah you've got you've got options queen e2 is fine you can also go to c4 hitting yeah, like c4, yeah. those two spots um and uh yeah i would say it's one of those two squares right it's logically it's going to be like one of the light squares but it's good that bishop f5 didn't uh like scare you off right like the bishop's not better yeah. on f5 than on g4, so I'm glad that didn't didn't scare you from queen, queen d3. All right. Well, good job. Um, the the exercise that I have in mind. Well, I had I had another exercise I was going to do today, but but since you guys had some games for me to look at um we're not going to get to it today but i'll do it with you next week is i want to give you a game i'm deliberately going to put you on the side of like a player who does badly so we're going to do a kind of guess the move right but putting you on the side of like you know fisher or gary kasparov crushing somebody can be like it's that's the normal way people play guess the move right and it's like you're trying to guess like good moves and all that but um, I want to put you through like an opening where somebody does badly and see if you can find, you know, better moves than them under pressure. That's okay. a specialty. So, yeah. So instead of trying to play like the brilliant moves of Kasparov in a good position, you're going to try and play slightly better moves than somebody who got their head torn off. So we need to improve for NN. Right. And that doesn't I mean, mean you need to just like a bunch of my games. It doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean you need to like, you know, like come up with some like brilliant move, right? You just have to put up what I think is better resistance, basically. So that's that's the uh, exercise I have in mind for next week. Um and yeah, I think that if you guys have time, you could explore this past week's opening more there's room to play like a lot of games in that to uh check out some new territory um but i'm going to bring us back towards more mainstream openings now because like i pushed you into like weird stuff because i was worried about you know expanding your ability to deal with unfamiliar situations but now that i've stretched you that way we're going to come back to normal openings and you know see what you can do there so um okay. I'll, the the example i give you next week will be in a standard opening instead of something weird but if you wanted to practice 
um, this unusual Queen's Gambit I gave you, I think that would continue to be valuable. Yeah, I actually got that position a couple times in my regular games. Right, because it only That's takes two moves, yeah. right? Like, mm -hmm. you can actually get it. It wasn't even me playing for it. My, my opponents played it, and I was on the white side. Oh, you even had somebody play C5 for you as black? Wow. Yeah, maybe four games or something like that. It was, it was <laughs> That's incredible. That's very rare. Crush Baron, but they were like bullet games and three minute games, so I didn't really have a lot of time to think to the nuances. And I didn't right. want to analyze it too much because I didn't think it would be fair to Baron. Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you set out to play D5 against everyone playing D4, like you could, you could play this with black several times in a week. Like... Oh yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. No problem. But to get it with white four times <laughs> yeah. that's a surprise. That's quite surprising. That's a surprise. That's cool. Yeah, he told me after the the first after the second game when we were looking at the first one where he played uh D four after I did D takes five, he said, Yeah, uh I did this a couple times as white and then this D four pawn push was really, really annoying. Yeah. Yeah. Thought, yeah. I thought when you played it, I was like, oh, man, that's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you can see just getting some reps, like, helps with, uh, with, with gaining familiarity. But there's still a lot of, like, you know, reading to do with that in terms uh -huh. of what the For opponent's sure. trying to do. Um, I think at first when I gave you Knight C6 in the Scandinavian today, you guys didn't immediately like appreciate like super deeply like the pluses and minuses of the knight c6 move but you did come up with good moves yeah so, as you warmed up to the position very good moves i mean better than what i played so that's that's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> um i know it's been like a bit with like the christmas new year's break do you guys have any questions or anything you want to bring up with me uh, there's not a lot of tournaments. Uh, I don't know if it's because of the beginning of the year or what, but I'm mm -hmm. having trouble finding a good tournament. Like there's a few, but they're pretty far away. Um, there's like one that's like, a, I think it might be a master's only tournament. Hmm. Um, and the smaller tournaments are like on, on a Tuesday at 6 PM. So I can't go to those cause of work. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's only what I've like been able to look at. I actually got COVID during the break. So, uh, I kind of didn't really wasn't focused on chess for or at least looking at tournaments so yeah how so bad was it was i'm thinking that i'm getting it tomorrow so what's the preview uh for me it was just like a bad fever for four days and then some no stuff i lost my taste and smell for like three days or something like that mm -hmm. um i barely had a cough and then it was just like kind of felt like allergies it wasn't terrible um but i'm double faxed so Mm -hmm. That probably helps quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> um, so that was that was my experience, but like every like two two three fifths of the house got it. Uh, mm -hmm. So my daughter and my fiance both got it as well. Um, daughter had a bad cough; she sounded terrible, but she was fine after a few days, and uh, kind of the same for my fiance. So it really wasn't. I mean, it's still scary. You don't want to have it, but, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah. for us. Well, yeah, wasn't, wasn't I'm too. getting more concerned with this pending OTB tournament a week from next week, so MLK Junior weekend, because I was driving to the grocery store and saw this massive line for the drive-through COVID testing by it. I was like, oh, yeah. oh man. <laughs> yeah, throughout the pandemic, I've gone by this place where they do like testing, and you can just see the surges in the line. <laughs> it was just like cars were everywhere lined up for this place i was like oh i don't know if this is such a good idea right now so yeah but i got my dojo classical games to play in yeah my streaming so. schedule is about to be interrupted after tonight for you know the viewers who are here right now they can already know that my schedule is about to be interrupted you know my my kids are going to be home from school because of covid exposure i think and yeah we'll probably we'll probably not be able to stream much for a couple of weeks while we quarantine 
Yeah. Okay, well, if you can't find an OTB tournament or if it's just not the time to play an OTB tournament, then you still need a goal. It's going to help you a lot, right? To have like, not yeah. like a goal, but like a focus, like a thing that you're building up towards. So, you know, let's just like create like an online tournament for you to like aim towards, you know, like pick a weekend that you can like clear up and then let's just make like a dojo tournament then. Okay, I can do that. Another thing I've been doing is I've been f- focusing on keeping on the leaderboard on this chess.com leagues thing, mm-hmm. which I know isn't like that big of a deal because it's kind of, you can, you get kind of rewarded even if you're just like, just playing a lot as opposed to like necessarily playing well, mm-hmm. um, as long as you do get your wins. Um, but I don't know. I'm, I'm having fun with it. Cool. It's nice to stay in the in the leagues i got second place in last last week jesus so yeah that's how many games that's I very high that's very high <laughs> i failed to progress so oh no yeah i'm stuck in wood league maybe wood league. It's, maybe it's stone whatever the second one is i progressed the first week oh, and, yeah, and not the yeah. second week yeah I'm in, I'm in like ninth place in bronze right now. I gotta step it up. How high do you need to be to qualify again? I think it's top ten. Top ten. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck with that. Um. Yeah. If 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 it's not the time for OTB, I think about like what kind of like a what kind of an online tournament would be the best thing for you to like work towards. You know, like. Is it best for you if it's four weeks away or eight weeks away or 12 weeks away? And, you know, what kind of time control do you want? And then you can just start organizing it. And, you know, we'll promote it on the dojo and, and get a good turnout. All right. I don't know if Paul just lost his mic or something, but um. Oh, muted. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying the last tournament that was under my name wasn't didn't turn out so great. I think I lost all my games. That's right. That's, we don't have to name I... it after you this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we can still work towards something. Yeah. Cool. We can call it the No Longer Bronze League. <laughs> like it. Love it. Whatever the league is after that, you can tell me when you get there, and then we'll name it after that. Okay. <laughs> um, Baron, any anything you want to check in about? Uh, so my plan is to start looking at a lot more um, like classic and master games. Mm-hmm. And I was just want to ask about apart from you know I've got all these books and just reading through comments and variations and trying to look at like you know what's the threat, what's the point. Tell me what books you have. I'll tell you which one to read first. Uh, oh, the f- four I've got that I was thinking about is I've got that 500 Master Games by Tartakower. Great. Then I have the Fisher 60 Games. Mm-hmm. I have the Yayekin Collection. Nice. And I also got for Christmas the Bronstein Zurich Tournament Woo! book and the uh, My Life in Games by Woo! Paul. Okay, so you've got like several of the best five books ever written or something kind of right there. Okay. Um Well, I would start with Mikhail Tall. Life and Games. Yeah. I would start with that. And you can kind of do things in any order you want, but there's two different orders that would be logical and depending on how much time you're going to put in, you should pick one or the other. So one order that's logical is from the most fun to the least fun. And that's the order that makes sense if you don't know if you're going to get through everything, right? Then you make sure you get the best thing, right? It's like if you're not very hungry and you just like decide to eat the dessert (laughs) because otherwise you might not get it. (laughs) So the other logical way is to start from the beginning and work your way through chess history. 
But the thing is, like, if you get bogged down in 500 master games, because that's a lot of master games, and if you try to understand every move of every game, and, you know, I don't think the annotations are, like, the most, like, thorough. Um, so if you get, like, bogged down trying to, like, figure everything out for yourself beyond even, like, what the annotations tell you about, and you never get to tall, man, that would be that would be so sad. Yeah. I think when I was trying it, I did it for about a month and then I just got distracted by, you know, this, that, and the other thing. I think I got to about, I was doing maybe like three or four games a day or so. Mm -hmm. And I think it was about one every 10 games was like, wow, that was a really great game. Mm -hmm. That was like a really interesting, you know, why this kind of stuff doesn't work. Yeah. And that was which book did you have that experience? That was the 500 Master 500, Games 500, okay. Yeah. Um, well, the good news is you're going through it at a good clip, so you're not, like, bogged down. Um, and, you know, the, the games aren't all, like, amazing, right? People weren't that good <laughs> at the time, right? That's, yeah. But that's kind of the idea is, like, you're picking up sort of, like, the development of ideas, right? So if you feel... You don't need to like understand the details and the details are probably not even true, right? And like the annotations are probably wrong as well, et cetera, right? Like what you just need to do for that book to be valuable is like you're picking up ideas. You're like, oh, that's an idea. You can withhold judgment on whether it's a good or bad idea, right? But it's kind of like idea gathering, like, oh, there's like an idea that you could win the whole game because the A7 pawn's isolated in the end game, right? Or, oh, in this kind of position, you can open the E file. Yeah, I definitely remember one game where the black played this um you know bishop g4 pin on the knight and then the white player just said go ahead and take it and then they played the castle king side they uh took on f3 g takes f3 and then in the game they just played something like king h1 rook g1 and i'm checkmating you right because they also black also castle king side right and i used that in the game and i was like wow that was pretty effective yeah so whether or not stuff is like accurate and whether or not the and whether or not you understand like all the options like that's like too much right but like the idea is that you're just like picking up the ideas in the order in which people figured them out like you know at some point you'll come across some like ideas where people defend against that same idea and you'd be like oh <laughs> i recognize this idea that i thought was so good now I right. see, like, what you can do about it. The thing is, like, maybe Tardikauer didn't yet know what to do about it, right? Maybe nobody had yet dealt with that at the time. So those are your two options. You start with the funnest stuff, which is My Life in Games. And it does have the benefit that a lot of other dojo people are reading that book right now because we've, like, recommended it very highly. So it has, like, the fun thing that you can, like, chat with people about the games in it. I would guess there's like at least 10 people in the dojo reading that book right now. <laughs> um, or you can or you can start from like Tartakauer and just like work your way through history. So. All right. I'll have to give it some thought over the weekend. Yeah. Or you could ever you could every now and then treat yourself to some Mikal Tal, but also like slowly work towards him <laughs> at the same yeah. time. <laughs> Eat dessert every once in a while. Yeah. But probably not like read like all five books at the same time. Yeah. That doesn't have any particular benefit. <laughs> Oh, that was my big question. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. I'll see you next Thursday. Uh, I wish you all the best, and I will now turn to chat and see if they have any questions about your lesson. All right. Thanks, David. Great awesome. Lesson. Thank you. Cool. Right. Cheers. You're welcome. Have a good night. Good night. And Scott, I'm of like a similar opinion to what Stamen's saying. I think if you go, like you probably will catch Omicron. So it's kind of like, you know, okay. that's kind of like the trade-off at this point. <laughs> but anyway, let me try and see if there are any questions about this lesson just now. So we looked at two games 
in the Queen's Gambit with c5 on move 2 from black. And then we played through uh, some moves in this unusual Scandinavian that is before you now. Does anybody have any questions about any of the positions that came up, the evaluations I made, or um, why we're looking at these things, what my, the what my, what my thinking was with, um, with the choice of material, or anything like that? Or even like, you know, maybe like just like the book recommendation that I just gave to Baron, right? Maybe someone wants to know like, what, what, what is this thing about in historical order? Or, you know, if you got any questions about that, ask me. Not too much longer, Cannibal Bishop. I've done my lessons, and now I'm happy to answer any questions about them. Also about the first lesson, if anybody like, still has questions from the, the first lesson tonight about attacking the king, the phases or stages of an attack. The fun book that we're recommending to everybody and that to a lot of people are probably reading it because we've recommended it a bunch is My Life and Games by Mikhail Tal, a very popular uh, world champion from 1960 played very entertaining aggressive chess and also wrote what I consider to be one of the two best chess books of all time I would say for for me you know like one of the two best books for me which student of mine of all time would I say studied the hardest Sam Shankland I would say of like any chess player I know personally, he probably works the hardest, studies the hardest. I recommend that you read books with good explanations, yeah. Do the books touch on like the what to do kind of stuff? Um, I'm glad you're watching those videos, Damon. Um, the books, yeah, I think I think some of these books that we're talking about will have some of that. They're not they're not systematic though, Damon, right? Like the there's nothing systematic about Mikhail Tal's book right it's just like here's a really cool game I played like I was excited about this like I got to go to a chess tournament yay I made it everybody yay <laughs> like, you know it's just it's just like cool stuff it's not in like a teaching order or something like that but it's like very like very like emotional right it's like the touch it's like the touch of somebody who's in love with chess. Right? It's just like inspiring. Somebody posted like the first page of the book on Twitter the other day, you know, and you just like reread that page and you're like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is what I want to be reading. You know, he's just like very very candid fellow ultra chess lover and yeah paul i think like sam's like one of the greatest chess teachers there is now as well as being one of the top chess players in the world but he's also like you know a candidate for like you know the best chess teacher in the english language right now because He's both a good player and a good teacher.
All right, but it's I'm sensing there's no questions about today's lessons. You know, you guys like to chit chat chess books maybe and stuff, but um, I have to go. I have to go figure out <laughs> what we're gonna do. Uh, what we're gonna do with our potentially compromised household. <laughs> so, um, if there's no questions about about the lessons, I will. Ah, you do. Okay, cool, Eric. Go for it. Yes. Sorry, Eric. I assume that was like understood. You're trying to attack the king, so you're opening lines aimed at the king. So you're opening up like a file towards the king or a diagonal towards the king. So maybe I was wrong to assume that that would be clear, but that was my assumption on that for sure. Um, that the only lines you're opening up are lines that happen to be between your pieces and their king. <laughs> um, control of the center being important. Yeah, that could fall under like preconditions maybe. Um, under preconditions for attack. But I haven't yet gotten into like in detail what's going to make an attack succeed or not just what the pieces of it are you thought that could have been confusing for lower rated players still hmm, maybe so hmm. thanks lucifer All right. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the comments. Oh, you've had that exact position. Cool. Well, now you've got a really cool move up your sleeve. And the confidence that that position is really good for white. The confidence is really helpful because I think a lot of times when people are in those offbeat Scandinavian lines, one of the main things that hampers them is like feeling uncomfortable and then playing too defensively because you don't have enough confidence in what you're doing. So the confidence should help a bit. Take care, everybody. Sorry to hear that, Scotty.